Live from the 22 News Broadcast Center, this is a special, your local election headquarters edition of 22 News Online. Good evening and welcome to our special election edition of 22 News. I'm Tishani Whitlow. We'll be broadcasting online all night with live updates of local and national election results. Tonight, we'll be joined by political consultants Tony Signoli and Paul Robbins. Thank you both for being here tonight. Thank now, let's jump right into it. It seems like we already have some races that have been called. We're actually going to jump out to our web center and find out exactly what races are already being called. Actually, we're going to wait on that. Let's first talk about the ballot questions and what they mean for people here in Western Massachusetts. Now, the first one is mm -hmm. question one. What are your thoughts on that? You know, question one was a uh, initially was sounded so grand on the on the yes side. There was such a move and such a uh, energy behind yes, especially too because the Massachusetts uh, Nurses Association was supporting it and behind it. Yes, and everyone likes nurses. I mean, the, the, everybody likes a nurse. You know, this is a positive kind of thing. But then you saw the preponderance of evidence, the facts start to come out. Not just that every hospital was against, and certainly there may be a venture, uh, vested interest <coughs> with the hospitals, but the other side of it was that every major media outlet in Massachusetts. Massachusetts came out against and made a case editorially against it. And then some other 70 or 80 healthcare organizations the same way. And it started to build, really build. So we've seen polling over the last four or five weeks now mm -hmm. that seems to indicate that the no side has a better propensity for success overall this evening. Absolutely. I remember there was um, a, a report, excuse me, mm. um, that was done a few weeks prior and it was actually split right in the middle. And now it seems like it's more overwhelmingly where they're, they're not supporting question one. You know what happens? What, uh, what, your, what are your thoughts? Is it all the political tactic, which is to take the other side's strength? No. In this case, nurses. So it was put on the ballot by nurses. So. If you have more money and you're strategic, if you're the other side and you sure. feel this would hurt you, you try to take that weapon away. So what they did, they got on early with nurses, somebody says, saying mm. um, this is bad. So the voter at home could say, well, wait a minute, I thought nurses right. were for this. So if you can confuse, and we see it in all yeah. campaigns now, yeah. take, take the strength of the other side. I'm sorry, Paul, I'm gonna have to stop sure. you right there. Now, we were just actually told that uh, NBC is declaring Elizabeth Warren and Governor Baker as the winner. So we're gonna head out into our newsroom to our web center with Tony Fay to find out exactly what's going on. What do we have out there, Tony? What's new? Well, the polls just closed in Massachusetts and um, NBC News is already projecting two winners in uh, two of the big key races in Massachusetts. In the governor's race, NBC has declared incoming Governor Charles Charlie Baker the winner, and uh, NBC has declared Senator Elizabeth Warren the winner in the three-way race for U.S. Senate. Now, the networks so sometimes do this when polling is so far apart with different candidates. Even as the numbers just come in, they'll just call a race as soon as it happens, and that's what we're seeing in Massachusetts. They also did that in the Connecticut Senate race with um, incumbent Senator Chris Murphy over there. So you, you do see this from time to time. Certainly the polls in both of those races showed the candidates very far apart. So this isn't terribly surprising that this call would be made this soon, but um, you know, there was some confusion even uh, in the newsroom. Some people were a little bit perplexed that the call would be made that soon on these races. But I suppose that NBC was making this projection based on kind of how far apart uh, Charlie Baker and Jay Gonzalez were in their race, and Elizabeth Warren and uh, her two challengers, Jeff Deal and Shiva Ayyadari, were in that race. So that's kind of uh, the very, very latest update here at our web desk. I'm Tony Fave, 22 News. All right. Thank you, Tony. Now, speaking of that, so Elizabeth Warren has been declared the winner. Governor Baker, also the winner again. Those two actually had very large margins with their opponents. Can you talk about that? Were you expecting the outcome to be something different? No, not at all. I mean, Elizabeth Warren is a national brand now. She's been an amazing United States senator in the time that she's been there. And she's got this incredible campaign apparatus, plus a war chest that's just gigantic. Mm -hmm. Jeff Deal just <coughs> didn't have that brand name recognition, didn't have those kind of ground troops or that kind of money. And the same, too, relative to Governor Baker. Uh, Governor Baker, you know, the, uh, the America's number one most beloved or most well-liked uh, governor. And running against Jay Gonzalez, who really, most people didn't even know who Jay was. There just wasn't the money or the time or the organization, really, to pull that off for him. He had a spirited Democratic primary against folks like Seti Warren and Bob Massey that took up some of his campaign treasure. Uh, 
And in the long and the short of it, just not the stature politically to take on a, a, a player like Governor Baker. I think the other thing here, too, everybody knows who Governor Baker's lieutenant governor is, Karen Polito. I think a lot of people would be hard-pressed to, to say who the lieutenant governor candidate was that was on the uh, uh, ballot with, with Jay Gonzalez. And yet a very, very good guy, and yet <laughs> just most people would not know who these folks were. So not surprised at all by this. Yeah. So they haven't, actually they're projecting mm -hmm. both of them will be the winners. So it hasn't been declared yet. Yeah. What do you think, Paul? No surprise. No. I mean, we're, we live in a uh, socially, uh, politically progressive state. Uh, even we, with a Republican governor. Even that's what would be my second point, <laughs> yeah. is that we're used to electing uh, socially uh, progressive, but fiscally conservative Republican governors. Uh, as a counterbalance. So that's kind of in our DNA in Massachusetts. If you go back, we've done this over and over and over again. So that's no surprise. Mm -hmm. It's no surprise uh, that a progressive like Elizabeth Warren, who's a darling of the pro progressives, would do well in Massachusetts. So no big surprise yeah. here. It'd be interesting to look at the margins of each of them. Exactly, to go. see what those numbers actually are. Because I think especially <coughs> with Elizabeth Warren, that's what some folks will look at. How well did she do in Massachusetts, given that it's not a great secret that she's looking perhaps at something else yes. for 2020. And frequently people yeah. will vote against somebody that they like mm -hmm. to keep them there. Yes. Rather than to run for president. Jeez, we don't <laughs> want to run for president. Actually, Why don't I you know, yeah. vote for the independent yeah. or, or blanket? Yeah. The other thing that was curious is that she brought up this whole DNA thing in, in the course of her campaign, which from a strategic point of view, why would you do that? Yeah. Um, she obviously got advice that she had a huge lead, let's say 30 or 35 percentage points. Okay. There's a lot of equity to have. How are you mm -hmm. going to lose that on something like that? And so for me, it felt like she was um, practicing, rehearsing yeah. that issue uh, to an audience, a, a more favorable audience. But it still feels like that issue is going to be there if she runs for president, which we all think she's going to do. Yeah. So it seems like, OK, AP also uh, <coughs> is saying that Governor Baker will be reelected. Uh, to he'll maintain his seat in that mm. corner office, excuse right. me. Now, there is a, also um, a recent poll that came out that actually said people are not supporting Elizabeth Warren if she chooses to run for presidency in 2020. Mm -hmm. Are you surprised by that? I'm not. Why? I think they like her as a, a U.S. Senator. I think they want her to stay here. The other thing is running for a different office. We see it all the time. Mm. We see it in county offices where right. someone is a state representative or state senator tries yep. to run for a, a county office and those votes don't translate. Mm. Two different, you, you run for the office and the next office doesn't have the same dynamic. So I think people like her as a U.S. Senator and I think she may be maybe too progressive for some people in Massachusetts to run for president. One thing I liked about uh, watching those two, and we had this conversation mm. earlier, Tony, watching those two debate, it was like watching a ping pong match going back and forth. I mean, she was throwing blows at uh, Jeff Deal, Jeff Deal. Yeah. basically saying that he was a surrogate to President yeah. Trump, and mm. then he was saying sh she's more concerned with running for presidency. Can you tell me what was the reaction based on your political clients across the country? What were they saying when they were watching this That was match? exactly the case, that a lot of folks thought that this was a run-up. This was her stepping in the ring with a sparring partner, so to speak, who was in there emulating Trump, a strong Trump supporter, Jeff Deal, and she went to town on him. And even there, too, that's another thing. In addition, I agree with what Paul said on the DNA piece, especially that I didn't think it was done that well. It could have been done better. But I think in that same vein, we saw her use that huge capital that she has, knowing that she would win this race by, by significant double digits, to actually kind of take a spin around the park, so to speak, or around the racetrack to see what it might be like to get into the presidential, to try some things out. Because a lot of what she had to say was a little different for her. This wasn't the Elizabeth Warren that we see all the time. Yeah. She's rough and she's fiery on issues. But when it comes to polit politics, you almost got the feeling that she was getting ready for Trump if that were to happen. Well, the easiest way to get elected as a Democrat <clears throat> against a Republican is to paint the other side as Trump. Even though Trump got a lot of votes in Massachusetts, you're not going to win a statewide election by being a Trump surrogate. So it's kind of like simple, <laughs> you, know, yeah. Yeah. you know, the ABCs uh, paint your um, opponent as Trump. But in this case, it was true. He was, a, in a sense, a, yeah. a Trump surrogate. Uh, it'd be really interesting to see how this, um, this DNA thing plays out. Because I don't think we've heard the last of it, no, even though it came up in this, no. in this Especially piece. if her opponent is Donald Trump for 2020, <laughs> if that's the case. You know he's going to. It could be the most definitive, factual case that she can make, better than we actually just saw right now, and he's still going to go after it and still hit it. Because with 30% of the electorate, it's still going to fly and play. And with his base, it's red meat. Do you think her doing the DNA test was kind of similar to President Obama supplying his birth certificate? Well, I, you know, the first thing that she did was... Former Trump, president. Trump, Trump suggested it, for one thing. Why doesn't she take a DNA test? 
She waved it off uh, at the beginning, like that's yeah. foolish, and then quietly, privately did it, um, and then presented the results. I don't think she got the you know the reaction that she wanted to. Uh, so, you know, at this point, you're trying to take your negatives, right, and address them, neutralize them to some extent. And I think that was probably the thinking behind it. Mm. Let's get that in front of a, an electorate. Mm. Let's get past it. Say, hey, we won in spite of that. And then go from there. I don't think it's going to be that simple if yeah. she runs for president. No. So I actually just got word that Massachusetts just elected its first black woman to Congress. I'm assuming that's going to be uh, Ayanna Presley. Ayanna Presley. Uh, yeah. More than likely, right yeah. out of Boston. I would say that was uh, an easy odds on favor for this evening, too, after the tough primary that she had. Yeah. Absolutely, because they, yeah. a lot of people weren't expecting her to unseat her opponent, who was uh, who well been in office for a long time. Well respected congressman. Yeah. You know, what's happened is the parties have both gotten more to the edges. And so progressives are very mobilized, just like super yeah. conservatives are really mobilized. So I don't think Capuano actually saw that coming, uh, but that's the sign of the times. How many times do we see that? We saw yeah. that in the House. Yeah. The uh, chair, chair of Ways and Means in the Massachusetts right. House lost right. a, a primary. That never happens exactly. in Massachusetts. Yeah. As well as the majority leader in the Massachusetts House. That just does not happen. A sitting speaker with two of his main uh, leadership players, to see both of them go in a Democratic primary, not against a challenger from the other party. Uh, and of course we saw it in the New York uh, Congressional District Absolutely. 14. Uh, surprises to a degree, sure, but uh, Paul's right that this change is starting to come about, but there was one other thing we saw when we started to break down what happened afterwards. For Ayanna Presley, she was a good candidate. That's something that folks can't take away from her. Yeah. And she got out there on a lot of key issues, but one other piece, younger voters recognized that Capuano was their kind of a congressperson. He was right on the issues. He voted with them on, on things that were important to him. But he was the old guard, kind of what Paul just touched on. And she was the young, and they want that change. You've been there for 20 years, you've been there for 15 or 30, whatever. I want someone else now, because you've been there long enough, so you and know, I haven't seen change. It may, may, it may not be the D or the R, it might be <laughs> the I for incumbent next yeah. to your name that creates trouble, because well that's yeah. starting to happen. You're starting yeah. to see, throw the bums out, even though yeah. they're not bums, because yeah. people want change. Can you talk about that? So them, oh, I guess, voters electing Ayanna Presley. What does that mean for Massachusetts? I know we've always been a progressive state, our first black governor, but what does that mean for her and this new, I guess, political climate that we're in? Well, I mean, I think for the short term, she's a rock star yeah. because she pulled off the unthinkable. And to have a well-respected, popular congressman lose his seat uh, to her in a primary, um, what it could do, it could tent tilt the rest of the delegation in their primaries coming up in two years to think about that wing of the party. And I really feel like this was created by Bernie Sanders. So you had this, this, this whole yeah. nation that, that was established with, with Bernie Sanders. A lot of young voters, yeah. as, mm -hmm. as Tony said. Mm -hmm. They're not going away. They weren't happy with the result. They weren't happy with the Clinton, uh, the Clinton, uh, Bernie, right. you know, play that went forward in the, in the, in the final there and mm -hmm. the, the super delegates and all that stuff. So that those people are still out there. <laughs> they didn't go away. Yeah. And so they're still influencing these primaries. And I think that's the surprise, at least for the Democrats in a place like Massachusetts, that you have to watch your flank on the, on the yeah. liberal side. The other thing for these new players like Diana Presley, and she's sharp enough to understand this and know this, she's got to move fast to make things happen for her district. She's got to show that you've put me here, he had seniority, he had relationships, he brought, he brought a billion dollars back to his congressional district in his time as congressperson. Now you've got to produce as well too. In the old days, you could wait four years, five years, six years. You waited. Elizabeth Warren changed that. She got elected and within months was banging on Wall Street's door. You know, launching legislation, making alliances with other, other members of the Senate and all. Literally going to Barack Obama, who had been her great supporter, and saying, I love you. Thanks for endorsing and supporting me. But let's go after Wall Street. You promised to do this. Let's go. So I think that's what you're going to see. And, you know, for some of these younger folks, they've got to produce especially like Ayanna Presley, when you've got a comparison to a predecessor who brought back that kind of money. Well, when you spoke of younger voters, it, from what I've heard, it seemed like this election, there was a high voter turnout, very similar to a presidential election, which is something that's different from midterm elections. Can you talk about that energy and where this young body well, of voters I mean, came from? One of from? the things that's happened, and <clears throat> I talked to a millennial, my son, about this, uh, <laughs> and he said since the time that he has kind of come of age, the yeah. president was Obama, and there wasn't a problem with the, either of those elections, and we weren't nearly as divided. Yes. So I think what happened is I think young people took mm. things for granted, you know, that 
the system kind of goes along. Wow. We had, you know, a president that won fairly easily in both and agreed with, you know, my principles. Along comes this uh, incredible election that surprised everybody with, with Trump. And suddenly, wow, voting really matters. So I think, you know, when you're formative years, you see something like that, which can be traumatic for, the, you know, progressive young people to see what happened. And things like global warming and things that they believe in that aren't being uh, followed and pursued by the executive leadership of the, the country, that gets you re-engaged. So I think that's, that was kind of the wake-up call, mm -hmm. a generational yeah. wake-up call, I think, that, that got folks more involved. And I think we may be seeing that tonight in terms of the numbers. What do you think? Do you feel the same way, Tony? I do very <coughs> much so. You know, you have to take a look at this from the standpoint of some of these voters, these millennials. Uh, Paul makes that good point. You know, they've known basically Barack Obama, uh, maybe a bit of Bush before him, uh, and they are more impatient. That's the other part of it. They don't want to wait. They're not satisfied for the for the old guard way of doing things, well. the old school, and yeah, we've got to go through committee and you know bills in third ring. No, I want this done now. I am uptight and I'm worried and I'm smart. They're so much smarter than we are. The information that they have access to is stunning. I see it in campaigns right now where I've got my 60-somethings who are involved in the campaign and my 20-somethings. And fortunately, I can kind of translate between the two groups, but the 20-somethings are stunning and amazing. And on occasion, I've got to stop myself to say, okay, tell me exactly how this works. How are you going to do a television commercial? that this group of people is going to see only. And that same television commercial is only going to be seen by a different group, specifically you know, altered and customized to what that group wants to see. This is a whole new age. I mean, this is stunning to me, some of this, the data mining aspect and all that. They understand how to get things done. And if they don't get it done through the process, that's the other fear for the old guard. They'll find other ways to come at this through the net, through other action, through other uh, 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 events, things like that, they even go around the body politics. So maybe not even wait for an election, as we saw with the, uh, uh, all the women that showed up in Washington right after Donald Trump was elected. Yes. Stunning. Mm -hmm. Shocking. So since you spoke of those two distinct voting groups, 20-somethings, 60-somethings, what are you hearing? What are their concerns? What are they saying that they're most concerned with in terms of how they're voting? For the younger, what I keep hearing, always, environment, environment, more than anything else, that seems to be one of the biggest things that comes back to us. Uh, certainly jobs, future, being able to uh, find that same possible uh, uh, employment relationship that perhaps my grandfather or my father had with the company. A lot of them are realizing too that that's gone, that they've got to be able to go out there on their own and make things happen. Uh, but predominantly it's more social issues that I'm hearing from the younger and from the older, perhaps because we're <laughs> thinking about it, you know. It's gosh golly gee whiz, how the heck did my 401k do? How is you know, what's happening on Wall Street, uh, employment, and then the commonality between the two groups, the healthcare piece. And they come at it from different perspectives. One can terrified about the cost, one terrified about access. So we hear that as kind of a common bridge between the two. I think younger people want meaning in their life and in terms of their jobs. Um, I think lifestyle, uh, the planet, uh, those things that are uh, a little more esoteric but really important mm -hmm. And I think older people are worried about things like Medicare, Social Security. You're going to take that away from me. Mm -hmm. Got it. Well, it looks like we're going to go to our uh, 22 News reporter, Jody Reed, who is at Governor Baker's office. I'm sorry, not at her office, at his office, at his campaign party, where he just won for a second term as Massachusetts governor. Now, 22 News State House reporter Jody mm -hmm. Reed is live at the Heinz Convention Center, where Baker is having his campaign party. Jody? Republican Charlie Baker will serve a second term after beating Democratic challenger Jay Gonzalez. Everyone in the room is excited and optimistic, waiting for Governor, waiting for Governor Baker to arrive later tonight. We're here at the Heinz Convention Center, where everyone is excited to welcome the governor and welcome his second term. At the Heinz Convention Center, Jody Reed, 22 News. All right. So uh, now we're thank you for that, Jody. We're going to jump right in now. We're going to go to question two right now, which asks voters if they want to create a 15 member citizens commission. Now, the commission would consider and recommend potential amendments to the U.S. Constitution and establish that corporations do not have the same rights as human beings and that therefore the political contributions of those corporations should be limited. Now, any resident in Massachusetts who was a United States citizen would be able to apply to be appointed to this 
this 15 member commission. Paul, this is a question that is very interesting. What do you think about this? Do you really think that we could make amendments to the U.S. Constitution? Do you think that this 15 member council will actually pass? It's going to be an awful lot of work for these 15 folks, and where does it really go? It's one state having a, re a referendum that you can almost say is non-federally binding. <laughs> it has no impact on the Constitution. It's, it's all kind of a cursory thing. It's, it's wonderful, it's great in theory, but uh, gosh, I think that's one of the reasons too that a lot of people really weren't familiar with this question and much more so focused on the other I, I think it's fascinating actually. Mm -hmm. because it I, is. Yeah, <clears throat> I think people are fed up with, with money in politics. A lot of people forget that the political action committees that now are the super commonplace in wallpaper in our lives mm -hmm. were actually a reform after Watergate. When Richard right. Nixon ran for president a long, long time ago, you as an individual could give it whatever kind of, you give a million dollars. You can't do that now right. because of, because of um, you know, reforms. One of the reforms was political action committees. So it's gotten to the point where it's political action committees on steroids. So I think there's a lot of frustration out there. And I th find this fi fascinating because there are other states that are doing the exact same thing. Not that you're ever going to be able to change the Constitution in a constitutional convention, but if you had 35 states who passed something similar, if I'm representing those 35 states mm -hmm. in Congress, I'm probably going to look at that because that's a, that's a tidal wave. So we're at the really early stage here because Congress hasn't been able to you know, modify its behavior with taking in political action committee money. Um, so I think this is, this is something to really keep on the radar. Yeah, this could be one of those things I referred to where people thinking about how do I make change and go outside of the body politic to do it. And I think Paul's right. The other piece of this is that, you know, does this overturn Citizens United? Probably not. It doesn't actually do that. But certainly one of the most egregious things that I've found in our time mm -hmm. in doing this is that I am stunned by the amount of money that corporates can spend. The whole Citizens United piece completely amazes me because there was a day we couldn't do any of those things. It was illegal yeah. to do what some of these corporations are able to do right now. And there is. There's an awful lot of folks angry and upset about that. Hopefully this does go somewhere. There's even money now filtering you know, on the, I always say that, you know, the, 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 uh, the bench in the, in the AAA and the AA, uh, you know, leagues are now being yeah. infec infected by this. Uh, mass, mass Fiscal Alliance exactly. is outside dark money that's yeah. come into Massachusetts and they've targeted a number Great of state example. representatives in Massachusetts. Yeah. That never happened yeah. before, right? That's right. That's starting yeah. to happen. Where's that money coming from? People yeah. don't know. They don't have to know because that's right. corporations have rights to spend unlimited resources. So it's getting into the farm system of the political system, which is a little scary yeah. because it was at, at the national yeah. level. Now we're seeing it uh, in the local campaigns as well. And I think people are frustrated by yeah. that. So it's fascinating yeah. that this made it to the ballot. And I think it'll pass, you know, by a large amount. All right. Well, thank you for that. We're actually <coughs> going to take a quick break right now. We're going to look at some of the election results, and we'll be right back with more up-to-date election coverage. Stay with 22 News for our exclusive online election coverage.
Live from the 22 News Broadcast Center, this is an update from your local election headquarters. The time is now 826. You're watching 22 News' special election coverage. The polls closed just under half an hour ago, and voters have been at the polls all day, deciding several major state and national races. And just after the polls closed, NBC News declared U.S. Senator Elizabeth Warren the victor in her Senate race against her Republican challenger, State Senator Jeff Deal. And Massachusetts voters also have to decide who will lead the state for the next four years. And NBC News has declared Charlie Baker the winner for a second term as governor. He defeated Democrat challenger Jay Gonzalez. The governor's race and the U.S. Senate race were called right when the polls closed at 8 o'clock. And there are also three statewide ballot questions. We are still waiting for those results to come in. For question one, a yes vote would create a law that would limit how many patients could be assigned to each registered nurse in Massachusetts hospitals and certain other health care facilities. A no vote would keep the current system of nurse staff in place. If the yes vote wins for question two, a commission would be established that would work to prevent corporations from contributing large sums of money to po politically motivated causes. A no vote would keep the current federal law in place, allowing corporations to donate unlimited amounts of money just to ballot questions. And question three is in regards to a law that adds gender identity to the list of prohibited grounds for discrimination in places of public accommodation, resort or amusement. Amusement. A yes vote would keep the current law in place, which prohibits discrimination in public places based on gender identity. A no vote would repeal this provision of the public accommodation law. And 22 News is your local election headquarters. We'll also have special online coverage, coverage throughout the night. And you can also get a wrap up of all the results on 22 News at 10 and 11. our 22 News special election coverage. I'm Tishani Whitlow. People have been at the polls all day across the country, including right here in Western Massachusetts. Our Washington correspondent Morgan Wright is live in Washington, D.C. to talk with us about some of the races going on nationally. Morgan, thank you for joining us tonight. Now, yeah. what, what has inspired Democratic and Republican voters to get out to the polls this midterm election? Well, there's certainly a lot to inspire them, but uh, political experts that I've spoken with have said this doesn't come down to an issues-based election, but rather a referendum on President Trump and his agenda. Voters are either going to vote for President Trump and his agenda or vote against him. On the other side of that, Democratic officials that I've spoken with have said that the issues do matter. Issues such as health care, immigration, gun control, and the economy are all playing a factor into how Democratic voters will 
cast their ballots this evening. In addition to that, President Trump's rhetoric and tone in the weeks and days heading up to this midterm election has been key, a key factor for Democratic voters. Republicans on the other side have been fired up since the Senate uh, Democrats behavior during the Kavanaugh hearing and immigration being a key issue of President Trump, the Honduran caravan that has currently made its way to the United States border in the weeks and days ahead of this midterm election has fired up the Republican base and voters are really coming out to take a stand against key issues such as immigration. Now, Morgan, what congressional races, excuse me, stand out the most in the Northeast region? Well, there are three states that we're currently keeping an eye on in the north, Northeast region, that is uh, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and New York. Pennsylvania specifically is very interesting because you have Pennsylvania's uh, Congressional District 17 that is currently pitting a, a uh, incumbent, that is, versus incumbent, Connor Lamb versus Keith Rothfuss. This is an interesting race because Connor Lamb proved that in a special election victory earlier this year that these red seats that Trump won in 2016 can be flipped blue. President Trump won the congressional 18th district by nearly 19 points back in 2016. So it just goes to show that these ruby red seats can be flipped by Democrats. Uh, on the other side of that, we're paying attention to a lot of exit polls uh, for Senate races. Senator Elizabeth Warren has won her race. She's the projected winner there. Senator Tim Kaine is the projected winner in Virginia. Um, but key states that we're paying attention to in addition to Pennsylvania would be New York, New York 19 specifically, and New York 22. That's that's John Faso facing off against Antonio Delgado, and that's Claudia Tenney facing off against Anth Anthony Brindisi, that is. So these are uh, districts that Republican officials say their candidates have litigated the issues very well and that the Democrat candidates don't really fit these districts. So we'll pay attention to those as the polls close throughout the evening. What's been the president's impact on this midterm? Yeah, the president has been very influential this midterm election cycle and the weeks and days uh, leading up to this midterm. He's been out. He's been campaigning. He's been very vocal. Political experts have called him the campaigner in chief. He's tweeting. He's helping candidates uh, rev up their bases with issues such as immigration, drawing this storyline back to the Honduran caravan that has made its way to the United States border. He's revving up his base on key issues and really helping Republican candidates candidates who may need that extra push to get them over the finish line. So he's been very influential and very uh, had a very strong impact on this midterm election cycle. Now, Morgan, now what happens if Democrats d regain control of the House and the Senate? Yeah, that's a hypothetical at this point in time. We don't know what exactly will happen, but um, indicators point to that Democrats could take up issues such as gun control, something the Republicans have drugged their feet on in the past. So they could take up issues like gun control. They could also regain control of investigative committees and really hold President Trump accountable for his actions. So you'll see a lot of uh, a lot of President Trump's actions under a microscope as things progress. But as to if things will get easier for uh, getting done in Washington, that remains to be seen if Democrats regain control of the House or the Senate. So we'll see how that plays out. Thank you, Morgan. We'll have more from you at 930. That was Morgan Wright from our Washington, D.C. Bureau. Now we're going to take a live look at our newsroom where we can get some behind the scenes look at what we're doing and how we're working for you. We're actually going to our web producer, Monica. She's going to tell us what they're working on. Monica. Out here in the newsroom, we are getting numbers and constantly updating our website as they come in. We are also keeping an eye on social media. A lot of candidates announce victories on social media, so we're just keeping tabs on them. As you can see, Senator Warren, who is already the projected winner for re-election, she has also um, been active on Twitter thanking Massachusetts voters. And if you have any questions for the political consultants, just send them to report it at wwlp.com and we'll make sure they get to them. I'm Monica Ritchie for 22 News.
Tonight we are joined by political consultants Tony Signoli and Paul Robbins to discuss ballot questions as well as local and national races. Now, Tony, there's been a huge push to have people vote this year. We've seen it on a high profile level with celebrities like Taylor Swift, Oprah, and on the other side, we've seen Rush Limbaugh and True. Fox News host Sean Hannity. Can you tell me, is this really helping? Do you think this is actually helping or hurting? Anything at all that gets people to come out to vote, whoever it might be, whether it's Kanye West on one side of it or if it's uh, Taylor Swift on the other side of it, everything helps. But still it comes down to campaigns and candidates having to get their base out, get those folks that are dedicated to them in their voter identification, in their GOTV efforts. That's still what it comes down to because all the rest of it can just be noise. It can just be a lot of sensationalism and, and hype. But at the bottom line of it, it's those campaigns that mobilize their troops on Election Day or in early voting or with absentee ballot voting, you know, getting folks to the polls. It's still the hard work that's got to get done. What do you think, Paul? You agree? I think it's really a reflection <clears throat> on our culture right now, where it's hard to distinguish between pop culture and elections in sports, right? Mm. So everything has been kind of merged Learn. into the same um, lane. And a lot of that has to do with the 24 seven nature of our media. Social media has a lot to do with it. Um, people who have high favorable ratings are in entertainment. Let's face it, we have an entertainer, whether he likes to say that or not, as President of the United States. I mean, his, his name recognition shot up because of a show. Um, a reality the apprentice. show. The apprentice. Yeah. So that kind of broke through the mold. Uh, people generally didn't leapfrog from television into running for president of the United States. So someone's going to write a book at it about it someday. That how all these things have kind of the line has blurred between culture, entertainment, politics, mm -hmm. and I think it's more a reflection of that um, that people are trying to leverage their um, you know their popularity or their uh, you know the fact that they're stars, whether in sports or entertainment, into the political arena. Oprah. People mm -hmm. are thinking about Oprah running yeah. for president. You know, 10 They've years ago. They've been saying that a while, for yeah, a while you, now. You know, a long time ago, that would, you know, that doesn't make sense, but it makes a lot of sense to people because they might agree with her values because they have an emotional connection to her because of her show and because of the things that she does out in the community, the larger community. Really interesting that this, these lines are all blurred now. Um, mm. I think it's fascinating and, you know, it's not going to stop anytime soon. No. And Good President points. Trump was not our first uh, entertainer, R Ronald, Ronald Reagan. Reagan. Sure. He was an actor. Yeah. But he was yeah. a governor. Exactly. He was a, he governor. Had, yeah. he was a yeah. governor first. A governor who had served in a state, California, sixth largest economy on the planet at that time. Uh, and on top of that, had run for the presidency before, too. And had uh, policy kudos within the Republican Party at Republican National Convention after convention. He was a player. He had pedigree. You're yeah, right. Yeah, I think he was a... Um, a, a politician that happened to be an entertain no. entertainer, just like someone was a lawyer and ended up going, you know, yeah. it was less a connection between his, his popularity and, and he had been a, a star many, many years uh, ago. And he did, as Tony said, had yeah. uh, credentials in the conservative movement and won uh, an election on the state level. So we heard about some of the popular races that we should be on the lookout for from mm. our D.C. Uh, Bureau reporter, Morgan Wright. But what other races should voters here in Western Massachusetts, in Massachusetts on a whole, what should we be looking out for? Well, you know, it's not so much what we're looking out for this evening. Some of it's what's, what's already happened. Obviously, Congressman Richard Neal has been reelected. Congressman uh, McGovern has been reelected. And they're both ranking members of their committees. One is about to become the chairman of Ways and Means if all the final lifts mm -hmm. happen. One is about to become the chairman of the Rules Committee if all the ifs happen. And that is astonishing, absolutely astonishing if that happens. Because McGovern, we don't hear as much about here in the 413. But if he is chairman of rules, the impact that it has is great. He will have a say over how the Congress operates. He'll also have a say, perhaps, in how redistricting goes. If it could have been argued that 2016 was the presidential election, certainly of Donald Trump and an entertainer, it was also the election about SCOTUS, about the Supreme Court. This next one is about how those lines get recut. That's one of the big things that perhaps we don't see. And what does that mean to us here in Western Massachusetts? Wow. I'm old enough That's to remember huge. chairmen of Ways and Means past tense. Yeah. When there was an early, when there was a Moakley, and certainly when there was Tip O'Neill back in the day, and the power that they welded and what they were able to bring back. If you look at what Neil has done in his time in Congress, what he has brought home, it's stunning. 
What can you do now as chairman of, of Ways and Means? Wow, those are two things to be aware of. And even too, just to quickly jump to maybe some of the other races, certainly District Attorney Anthony Galuni has been reelected. I think that's uh, uh, definitely, uh, he ran without uh, opposition this time around. And I think that, that says something for the job that he did for the last four years. Other folks too, one thing that a lot of folks have overlooked in the beginning of the year. There was a lot of talk about, gosh, golly gee whiz, there's not enough women in the Massachusetts legislature. And there's still <coughs> not. But four open seats in Western Massachusetts, women won all four. And one of those women is Joe Comerford, who's now replaced uh, <coughs> Senator Stan Rosenberg. Here's the former executive director of MoveOn.org, mm -hmm. someone who was part of a group uh, nominated for a Nobel Peace Prize. This isn't somebody that's going to be... Who, by the way, won in a write-in, yes. which yeah. never, ever happens. Yes. That is so Stop. hard Thank to you, do. Paul. Having done one of those yeah. and, and won, but yeah. with no one else on the ballot, but just yeah. to get on the, get on the, on the, on the ballot, yeah. extremely hard to do that. And to win by the margin, she did. And it was issues and whatnot. So I think you're going to see that as an <coughs> impactful thing to Western Massachusetts. These four women that have just been elected, working <coughs> now with the Senator Lessers and Welches and Hummusons for Western Massachusetts, and certainly the two members of Congress. I think Ball. overall, Massachusetts, in and outside of uh, Massachusetts, it's going to be the year of the woman. Think of the number of candidates. Uh, they said there were upwards of, if, if everything panned out right, which it may not, mm. you could have 100 members of Congress yeah. that are women. Uh, I think that's really um, earth shaking. I think it's great for the system that that's happening. Uh, but to jump back on something Tony said, if you look at the House, and Neil becomes no. chair of Ways and Means, uh, that's a game changer for Massachusetts and for Western Massachusetts. It also means something for the budget. The House controls the budget. On the Senate side, which is much less likely to go Democratic, you have the Supreme Court and all those district judges being appointed and put through the Senate. So you could have a situation where you have a president who's Republican who keeps putting conservative judges onto the Supreme Court and district judges, and you could have the House controlled by uh, the Democrats, which would control the purse strings. And one of the keepers of those purse strings would be Congressman Neal. So mm -hmm. it would be really interesting. You know, it would be good and bad yeah. ba based on your uh, political persuasion. And if you're Donald Trump, that worries you too. Because if the House goes Democratic, yes. there's less opportunity to mess around with the Mueller investigation. And you've got somebody who's a seasoned that. player, like Richie Neal, who's chairman of Ways and Means, who's already come out and said things like, I want to see the guy's taxes. Uh, Neal can be a strong partisan. We've seen that. He's a Democrat's Democrat. But the other thing about Richie Neal, and you hear it from Republicans in the House, they respect him. They like him. He's the guy they'll go to to shoot the breeze with about things that would make my eyes glaze over, like tax code. Mm -hmm. uh, they see him as someone who would be able to uh, be a deal maker, someone that they can deal with. So He's an institutional player. Mm -hmm. Perfectly We're living so. in a time yeah. where people get their chops on how liberal yeah. or conservative they are. Uh, Richie Neal, people forget he was a mayor, yeah. he was a city council. Of Springfield. Uh, yeah. Multiple. He gets the Tip O'Neill adage, all politics Perfect. are local. Very well said. And so, so he, he was, pr pr um, prior to him was Ed Bolin, who was in Congress for 30 years, who was also yeah. a chairman. So people in the, kind of get it in Western Massachusetts that if you're there for a long time, there's some power that ac accumulates and you become chairman of something. Yeah. Uh, so that's, that's significant, that's not to be lost. So those numbers that people are watching nationally, I'm going to make a big deal uh, in our region and for Massachusetts. It's going to be a lot of power that comes back here. And Neil is also the dean of the Massachusetts right. delegation mm -hmm. and the dean of the New England delegation. Mm -hmm. Stunning. Yeah. So uh, this is a question I, I believe a, a few of us have had. Why is the Hamden County, the, the deeds, the register mm. of deeds, why is that an elected office? That's one, of those, that? that's one of those <laughs> uniquely Massachusetts things. Right. Um, honestly, if you go to other parts of the country, there are county you know, races are, are big. It's kind of a vestige, but um, should they be appointed? Some states appoint those kinds mm -hmm. of things. Some states, you elect a judge. So that's the way it is. I don't think it's going to change. Um, but you, have a, you mentioned the deeds. It's a really interesting race. Uh, again, two women yeah. running for it. Yes. Um, the person that occupied it before didn't run, passed away. Anytime you have an open seat, you actually have a larger number of people that get interested in a particular seat and come out for it. You know, people talk about turnout all the time. When you have an open seat for anything, there's always an uptick in terms of, of turnout. So I think that's an interesting mm. one. I think the Brian Ash, um, Allison Werder race is interesting. Uh, that district was represented by Republicans. Right. Uh, um, the, the Brian Ash seat 
for a long time by two yeah. women. Mm -hmm. Iris Holland, uh, uh, Brian, Mary Roginus. Brian was a uh, you know town councilor in yeah. uh, for Long Meadow. in Long Meadow and yes. ten years at, at the job. So that that one mm. will be interesting as well as the the deeds race. I think. And his opponent, they're they're both from Long Meadow. Uh, Ellison right. Warder, yeah. which is Warder. forty percent of the yes. vote comes out of exactly. Long Meadow. Yeah. So whoever does Long Meadow, you know, yeah. is probably going to win that race. You don't have to wait for Hamden to come in, which keeps yeah. us up very late. <laughs> often. Yeah, that's but we've been in county races we, at the same have. time and waited till yeah. those would come in in the wee hours and whatnot. But Long Meadow is going to tell the story there tonight. But you're on target with the county aspect of this. I was on the county charter commission. We looked at county government and a lot of it was frankly politics. There was a thought to let's abolish it all. Let's put the county under the state, which did happen. But then gosh golly gee whiz, how do you say no to a guy like Mike Ash as sheriff? You know, did, did you appoint him and make him sheriff forever? Or how does that work? And that's those were the kinds of things that were being looked at at that time. But it's not a bad thing, though, to have accountability in a exactly. public office that interacts with the public and mm -hmm. all these things. Literally the next thing I was going to say, and some of these seats are important, too. A uh, race that Paul did, I want to say, 1990, Tom Moriarty. Yep. Uh, I remember there were a probate. lot of people back then saying, what is registry of probate? The average person didn't know about it. Tom Moriarty was able to make it clear. Here's what it is. Here's what it means to you. Gosh, golly, gee whiz, you could, could be at the worst moment of your life in a divorce or someone's past or there's an estate issue. That's what the registrar probate is and why it's important to be elected and to know who that player is. And so sometimes some of these seats are very, very, very important in how they actually impact people's lives. I would wonder about judges. I guess I would have a problem yeah, with that one. That but one I think that the offices that we're talking about in the Hamden County, I think it's perfectly fine. <laughs> yeah, seeing how public. the judgeships work yeah. in, in the South, especially with folks like Roy Moore back in the oh day. Oh my gosh. Yeah, yeah it's, that can be a little scary. Yeah. yeah. One thing I definitely do want to talk about, we didn't talk about question three, uh, which is about our transgender neighbors, if we should. An uh, existing law, uh, right. Existing which law, is very right. interesting yeah. that voters are not being asked to Undo vote something. in a new law. Right. We're voting to uphold it or repeal it. I think it. it's really mm -hmm. kind of a reflection of the wedge issues that are out there. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. And in that bucket is abortion, uh, transgender rights, LGBT. Uh, let's face it, Massachusetts is really kind of a non-discriminatory politically state. So it was interesting that this group got it on the ballot. Um, and talking about public yeah. accommodations, thinking maybe that there was a wedge there. So it just proves that you can put a wedge issue out there in mm -hmm. any state, even including Massachusetts. Yeah. Don't think that's going to get overturned. I think yeah. people feel, that, you know, when you, when you use the word discrimination, I think that bothers okay. it's a strong word. voters Absolutely. overall, but certainly in Massachusetts. Absolutely. Yeah. And I thought that the ads and the campaign uh, by, by the, uh, uh, the yes side was brilliant in that regard. Or I'm sorry, by the, uh, the folks who were for keeping the uh, law as is. I mean, they had former law enforcement, police officers, others coming out to say, this is <coughs> a discriminatory thing. It's just wrong, plain wrong. And we don't want to be known for this in Massachusetts. And we're seeing the numbers Yes, now. I was yeah. just about to <laughs> say you. that. It looks like it was upheld. 81% yeah. voted Huge. yes to keep that law yeah. uh, intact and on yeah. the books. What do you think, I wasn't sure how that vote would go, just considering the political climate that we're in, even though we are in Massachusetts. Yeah, but, you know, the legislature passed the law, and I think the legislature on something like this is really responding to their constituents. I think they see that uh, it's become an issue. Um, so if it was in Iowa, I think it'd be more of a divisive issue, but in Massachusetts, I think the legislature was responding to a no. need they felt that was out there because it is a question. It, ca it came up uh, a couple years ago in North Carolina. I don't think they've recovered from that. Mm. So I think th it was almost an opportunity for the pro side to say, okay, we're gonna put on the ballot since we already passed the law. Um, just curious that in the times that we live that uh, there was a group out there that thought they could wedge this. And, exactly, and, and they could get yeah. enough signatures to yeah. put it on the ballot and do this. So there's always going to be that group of folks out there, and quite often we'll say, gosh, they're going to pick up 30% of the vote just for the heck of it. It's interesting tonight that they didn't get 30% of the vote. It appears that it's much less than that. Yes. Uh, and, you know, God bless some of these folks for whatever their beliefs may be, but we look at these issues often as the hater issues, you know, the kind of issue that will speak to the lesser angel of, of the elector or the individual. And again, the campaign done by the other side, by the winners this evening, I just thought it was so well done. Well, you know, the thing that was fascinating to me is these wedge um, issues about societal things are very rarely legislated. Uh, mm. Legislators go to pass a budget, to yeah. pass programs. Um, you know, Roe v. Wade is not in mm. the Congress, but right. it's used in so many statewide Absolutely. elections, used in so many Senate elections. Um, it's irrelevant because it's past law. It's really more about, um, you know, the, the Senate and yeah. the president uh, appointing somebody. 
But it's become really red meat. And I think if you go back, to me, the jump ball that happened on this was the famous Willie Horton ad right. that um, attacked right. really people's sensibilities from a discrimination point of view and scared people about Mike Dukakis, who was mm. our governor mm -hmm. in Massachusetts, who was running for president. It was a PAC committee that Rough. developed that ad. And it really was a game changer in that, in that campaign. So once you, you know, political operatives see success, they're going to go to that playbook over yeah. and over again. I think that's unfortunately the, you know, the, the spin cycle that we're in right now. So we also have some other questions as well. Now question four. That was a question that uh, was non-binding. That was four and five. That's only a question that certain uh, areas in our region are answering. Mm. Now four was about uh, having a single payer uh, single health care system. What do you all think about that? Do you think that's something that the state should possibly consider it's or another the one of, It's very similar to me to the, the, the uh, PAC issue. People want, you know, there's a tremendous amount of energy, at least in Massachusetts. Uh, Bernie Sanders certainly brought that to people's attention, a single payer system. Obamacare was a step in that direction. Um, and I think, unfortunately, for a lot of people in the country, they're finding that they're losing their mm. health insurance and going back to the old system and saying, well, wait a minute, that maybe wasn't so bad. NBC, I think, has uh, thrown out the, poll, the, the um, exit poll numbers and said the yeah. number one issue is health care. Yeah. Uh, you can talk about it all you want. You can try to scuttle it all you want. But in your life, if you're having trouble paying your medical bills, you want it solved and you think the government ought to help you solve it. All right, well, well sure. we're going to take a really qu quick break, so hold that thought, Tony. Uh, you're watching 22 News' special election coverage, only available online at WWLP. We're going to take a quick break, and we'll be right back with more results.
live from the 22 News Broadcast Center, this is an update from your local election headquarters. Time right now, 8.56, you're watching the 22 News Special Election Night coverage. Polls closed just under an hour ago. We already know the outcomes of some of these races. No huge surprise. It is four more years for Governor Charlie Baker. Baker was declared the winner of a second term just moments after the polls closed. He beat back a challenge from Democrat challenger Jay Gonzalez. Republican Governor Charlie Baker reelected. Another expected outcome, this one in the U.S. Senate race. Democrat Elizabeth Warren will serve another six-year term in the U.S. Senate. Massachusetts senior senator beat back a challenge from Republican state senator Jeff Deal. And we have some early returns here in the western part of the state. Democrat incumbent state representative Brian Ash has the early lead in the second Hamden district race. He is holding a lead against his Republican challenger Allison Werder. And we have some early results in the hotly contested race to fill the seat left vacant by the death of longtime Register of Deeds Donald Ash. And we see here it's a seesaw race with the leads. Democrat and former state representative Cheryl Coakley Rivera has the early lead over Republican Longmeadow select woman Marie Angelitas. Uh, we should point out that these are early returns with a small percentage of the votes counted so far. And in the third Hamden district race, incumbent Republican Nick Boldiga has a lead over his Democratic challenger, Forrest Bradford, 25% of the precincts reporting. And in the race for the second Hampshire district, House seat Democrat Daniel Carey, lopsided lead over Republican Donald Peltier with 42% of the precincts reporting the seat is open following the decision by State Representative John Seibach to retire. 22 News is your local election headquarters. We'll also have special online coverage throughout the night. You can get a full wrap up on 22 News at 10 and 11. The, this is actually a live video. This is Senator Elizabeth Warren's campaign party. It's taking place at the Fairmont Copley Plaza in Boston. We have our reporter Haley Crumbleholm. She's there. We'll have a live report from her later on. But it looks like they're still uh, waiting on the rest of the numbers to come in, despite her already being declared early on due to that large lead that she has over her opponents, 67 percent. But these are still early numbers. Uh, she hasn't been declared as of yet. Those numbers are still coming out. But it looks like from that huge lead that she has, that she will be reelected to the U.S. Senate seat, Elizabeth Warren coming back for uh, re-election. What do you guys think about that? You said you weren't surprised to it, see her win, oh, no, if, not, if she's yeah. declared the winner. Sure, and she definitely will be. I think, you know, without a doubt, she had the war chest, she had the name, she's got national standing. Uh, she won a significant <coughs> first victory to get her there in the first place uh, against Scott Brown. That was huge, and that was noted nationally as well. So this is not a great surprise at all. Now what we'll be watching is how soon might come another announcement. How yeah. soon does she start to think about, you know, making an announcement, if she is going to, to look for the presidency. People forget that this was, yeah. the, this was the Ted Kennedy seat. Thank you. Yeah. All right, so yeah. there's a certain torch that's carried with that mm -hmm. seat from yeah. a pro progressive chops point yeah. of view. Tony mentioned that you know, she was a hero for unseating Scott yeah. Brown, yeah. Um, yes. who filled that seat. Um, I think Martha Coakley. Took it, so to speak, yeah. yeah. Which was shocking. Of course, yeah. it was at the time of the debate around health care. Yeah. So people were, uh, you know, the progressives were appalled that Ted yeah. Kennedy's seat went to a conservative Republican. Yeah. So, uh, you know, she kind of carries the mantle of that Kennedy seat, I think. So I think there's that whole progressive, uh, yeah. you know, bundle that's, that's riding with her. And as Tony says, 
everyone's looking to see what the next announcement is. So no surprise, but um, there's a lot of passion around her yeah. because I think partly because it's that Kennedy seat. And she traveled around the country during advocating her race. for yeah, other Democrats race. as well. Absolutely, yeah. Which can and be a little risky, but yeah, she, even she was playing with the House's money. Absolutely. Very, very well said there, too. And even with some of her own, too, relative to her campaign war chest, making campaign uh, contributions to other senators yeah. in tough races. So she's ingratiated herself a bit there, too. All right. Now, Barry, you had some questions for our <laughs> political consultants here. Yeah, I, they let me stick around after the update. <laughs> so, uh, We're not good. giving you the boot We're just not, yet. This is WWOP.com. <laughs> we can say whatever we want. And uh, thank you for letting me be here. And uh, we're having that discussion about uh, Elizabeth Warren's progression to her seat to mm. where she is now. And, uh, yes, uh, that was traditionally Ted Kennedy's yeah. seat for half a century. Yeah. Uh, and uh, she did wrest it away from Scott Brown, who held mm. out, was it two years that he even had it? After Ted mm -hmm. Kennedy's death yeah, and uh, finished the term, I famously finished. said at the time that uh, Martha Coakley will forever be known as the Bill Buckner of Democratic <laughs> Massachusetts <laughs> politics <pretty> good. <laughs> because she should have held on to that seat, but uh, yeah. somehow it slipped through. You can't get complacent in politics. No, you, can't. Yes. Yes. you never know. Oof. But uh, so it's uh, it, Liz Warren for another six years. Is it six years? That's the question. You know, Big I mean, question. And, and that was uh, it was it was fair of her opponent to point out that she had been spending yeah. a lot of time going around the country. Yep. You know, she's running for the that's a commitment. Six yeah. years, yes. but does she intend to do that? She said, "Let's see how this goes first. I mean, she wasn't saying that because mm. uh, she expected to maybe lose and then she'd run for the president of the United States. I think she was. Um, I think initially she was going to wait to run for president. It wasn't the time, and I think she was legitimately telling people that, that I think there was some kind of tripwire with Trump that just said to her, you know, Barack Obama didn't wait. People told him, you really should right. wait. <laughs> wait your yeah. turn. And he said, why? Now, the opportunity is now, and I think I could mount a- And it worked out. It, it did. Kind of, kind of worked out pretty well for him. Two Ooh. terms. Right. You know, I, something I was wondering about, I, I saw an article, I think, yesterday where some Republicans are complaining that Donald Trump is hijacking this midterm elections by uh, going around and making uh, immigration the big issue when uh, going back to Clinton times, yeah. it was always the economy stupid. No question. But uh, he and Republicans were saying, why aren't we talking about this great so, economy? So here's that non-traditional candidate that Donald Trump has become. You try to go with your strength. Let's face it, when he came down that escalator and he talked about Mexican immigrants, Overnight, he became a sensation within the Republican primary system, right? And he, a polarizing he, sensation. Very polarizing, but that's what got him there. And a lot of times a politician will say, I'm gonna dance with the one that brung you, yeah. right? So yeah. that's the issue he feels. Now, he's a bit of a neophyte. The reality is, if he was listening to his pros, uh, they would be pumping out commercials about the strong economy. Now, Absolutely. you could you could make no. the case that the eight years prior got us, got us here but if it's on your watch you're going to take credit for it so allegedly he watched the commercial that they had produced that touted the benefits of the economy look at this great economy we got almost full employment uh everything's at an going all time well. low i um, believe it's almost low. what right. in all five decades yeah. it's the lowest it's been and he looked at the commercial and said i don't like it i want to go with immigration right with his gut right what with his gut and his gut isn't always going to be right apparently because if you look at what people said in the exit polls, they talked about health care. Economy was in there, but it, w it, w it was above immigration. Economy, <laughs> yeah, yeah, immigration right. was the first, and then... Uh, immigration was down the bottom. Healthcare was second, and then the economy was third. So, you know, I, the, the idea that he would go with that strength, I guess he's learning a lesson tonight if the House goes in the other direction, but you always, it's the economy stupid, people vote with their wallets, they vote with what's happening at the supermarket, gas prices, it's those it's things. It's getting emotional now, though. Yes, it is. I think that's what's happening. Yeah, it is. And now, what do those members of Congress <laughs> who blindly, loyally stayed with him and who went along with this, who supported some of the candidates that got involved in some of these races, who really were kind of on the fringes, you know, what do they do if this goes the way that it looks like it is right now? Do they abandon Donald Trump? Do they start to go in a different direction? You know, two years goes by fast for members of the House, and every one of them is up for re-election every two years. So on the House side of it, if you're a uh, member of the House and you're a Republican, you're thinking about, gosh, golly, gee whiz, what does this mean for me in two years, or even right now, in trying to govern? Well, speaking of the economy, so what if dem Democrats, excuse me, do flip the house? What does that mean for the business sector, like people with 401ks? Should they be concerned? The biggest thing, actually, <laughs> I think is going to be tax policy. Yeah. 
When there's an economic downturn, the two things that economists tell you to use is a tax cut and government spending. And basically, all the gasoline has already been poured on the fire because they had this massive tax cut. They never got to the infrastructure bill because they can't pay for it. So the question is, things could turn ugly in the next two years? Guess who's going to be blamed? Partly the, the Democratic Congress. Absolutely. Well, we're actually going to check out and see what's <coughs> going on in our newsroom. We're heading over with our uh, web center with Monica and Tony. They are our web producers. We're going to find out what's happening online, which is what you're watching at WWLP.com, and see what the reaction has been. Tony and Monica. Hi, I'm Tony Fay. I'm the assignment manager here at WWLP 22 News, and I'm here with Monica, of course. Monica. I am a digital producer here at 22 News. All right, and we're just going to talk a little bit about sort of the social media aspect of this election. Now, you know, you think about social media a lot in terms of how it gets people to talk about political things, to share their beliefs with others, but also it's been a really effective tool in getting people to get out to vote. But for us here at 22 News, like a big thing about what we do is just following social media just to follow developments. So like what, what are some of the things that you're following right now, Monica? So all day we've been following candidates. They've been out making their last push for votes. And now we're starting to get in tweets um, after the polls have closed, them waiting for the results just like we are. So we have some tweets behind us. Um, and we'll continue to update I'm that. I'm blocking it with my head probably. <laughs> we'll continue to update that as they come in, as candidates um, share their, their victories and, and whatever they're doing tonight. Yeah, absolutely, and we're going to be continuing to push things out on social media. Stay with 22 News here on WWLP.com and on the air tonight at 10 on the CW Springfield and at 11 on 22 News. We're just going to continue to bring you the very latest from both Eastern and Western Mass. I'm Tony Fay. And I'm Monica Ritchie. Thank you, guys. You are watching 22 News' special election coverage exclusively online at WWLP.com. We have our two political consultants with us. We have Tony Signoli and Paul Robbins, who are joining us tonight. Thank you guys again for sure, being thank here. thank you. Yeah. Now, um, one thing I wanted to ask you, because we kind of like touched on this a little bit, the Affordable Care Act. A lot of Republicans uh, voted against this. They, they wanted to repeal it. But now, a lot of them are also saying that they support this. Sometimes people vote against their own self-interest. It's the most damning thing when you're in, in campaign. So I have a good friend that's in Georgia. And so he was able to get um, health care under the Affordable Care Act. And family members also who had special needs. So it was really beneficial to him and his nephews and nieces. Mm -hmm. They voted against Obama. Mm. So they were, and why were they voting against him? Because of Obamacare. So now it's coming home to roost, right? Mm -hmm. So people are now having to confront medical bills mm. not being covered, not having these exchanges, and they weren't perfect, um, and everyone admitted they weren't perfect, but to scuttle it and now put it back on the, on the plates of the average person it's just really uh, incredible to me that the number one issue that people cited in the NBC exit polls was health care. It's important. how it hits you personally. It's how it hits Absolutely. your pocket, how it hits your sick child or your parent or the, your, you know, if you're a caregiver. Uh, politics is perception, not reality. It's often stated and often rough. And I think it was Joe Napolitan that made the, the yeah. term uh, as well known as it is. But the perception, <coughs> Paul's example is a great one. You know, here are these folks benefiting from the act, benefiting from Obamacare, and yet voting against it because the perception that they've been given is that this is bad, this is my problem, this is my headache, you know, mm -hmm. is that that. So, so often it's how the political consultants, how the folks that uh, put out the blue smoke and mirrors and, 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 and put these ads together or put these concepts together on these tough, difficult issues like this. This is a difficult and issue. And now fueled by social person. media. Exactly. And uh, so what's flims, true, what's not? Exactly. Yeah. Flimsy sources for this social media where you actually believe something that's a falsehood mm -hmm. and you become emotionally com committed to it, to your position. So that, you know, I always f felt that, and you, we famously heard from Trump when he said that I could shoot someone on Fifth yeah. Avenue. And get away and with get it. Away As with consultants, it. I can tell you we've all said that to a candidate that you have your 40% and you could kill somebody. We've yeah. all said this. Yeah. And there's 40 aren't going to go anywhere because yeah. people get. Now, he took it to the end <laughs> degree. Sure did. Shared wow. it with yeah. the public. Yeah. Yeah. And the reality is now it's coming home to roost. Uh, it's affecting probably Congress tonight on the mm. House side. It's yeah. going to be an issue in two years. Yeah. And will they fix it? Will he work with the Democratic Congress? It'll be interesting to see that. As Paul said, too, this is a political neophyte, but he's got some pros around him. And we're learning more and more about those pros in some of the recent pieces on PBS and other uh, in-depth 
documentaries about how he won. We're now learning more about how they spent $100 million on Facebook, outside groups, others, and whatnot to create perception. Uh, now the problem for him is going to be is that in this last week, and even before, the way he campaigned, is he made it very clear, this is a, an election about me. This is all about yeah. me. This is a referendum on me. So today, I think that there were 17 major newspapers in America. That was the headline. It's about me. It's on me. It's a referendum. And he's thinking, that's yeah. it. The base will come out, and they'll be fired up. Firing him up. But right. now you've got to deal with this. Does he start to act? You know, we've always said, we've always hoped that he would act more presidential. But does he start to realize and recognize what those issues are that are essential I think he's now? A, honestly, I think he's a realist. He's, he's not an ideologue. Mm. Mm -hmm. He's, he's co-opted the populism from the Democrats. He's got... Obama voters who were union people who voted for him, the guy who elected, yeah. and he's got um, the red meat um, social issue Republicans. So I have a feeling that he's going to find a way to try to deal with the Democrats. It's going to be fascinating to watch yeah. because they don't like each other, but they all want to get reelected. So it'll be interesting to see if there's some kind of accommodation that he makes because, because he's not an, an ideologue. I think he'll try to make a deal with yeah. them. Now, okay, so the migrant of car the ca migrant caravan, excuse me, that's right. inching closer and closer to the border. That has really been what he's been pushing at yeah. the forefront of this midterm election. But what I want to ask you two, do you feel that he responded appropriately and in a timely manner? He overreached in regards Good to the time. pipe bombs and the synagogue shooting. Because I don't know if you remember when yeah. the pipe bombs came out, he really didn't have a special. No, because that he was not, that first. was not to his advantage. Because right. think about it: every single person who received that in the was mail was a Democrat and a critic. Was of a his. critic of his bad politics. Very vocal critic. So, w what did he do? He changed the subject. The caravan was a convenient. You know, if I was dark in my belief, I'd almost think they set it up because mm -hmm. it was yeah, a perfect... Yeah, it seems so appropriate. It was a Hollywood. Exactly, yeah. exactly. We're not a Hollywood, dark. yeah. So that he found another issue, and since it was his sweet spot that he believes helped get him elected, he felt, I'm going to go with that because that will drown out the noise. And to some degree, that happened. The synagogue thing kind of got pushed away. Uh, the pipe bomb thing kind of got um, pushed away. The shootings in the yoga studio, and we almost didn't even hear about that. You know, these are things that are... Public policy can affect those things. Absolutely. Um, so th they got pushed away by that caravan. But did he respond correctly? He's never responded correctly in the norm of what we would consider a president, president. of the United States Absolutely. to respond. Whether it was these recent uh, horrors, part the Parkland shooting, he's always been, you know, th there's the other issues that come up about him. Perhaps what he really thinks in a racial sense, what he really thinks moves and motivates his base. Uh, he's never responded as a president should, as we'd expect a president, a Republican or a Democrat, or like my favorite president still on the West Wing, Jed Bartlett. I mean, he's just <laughs> never. You could, if you could just watch that show, if you're Donald Trump, and just Maybe try to act, try seriously, to something. just, just steal it from Alan Sorkin <laughs> and uh, and uh, the the the, play, the folks that wrote that and whatnot. My gosh, you know, yeah, just just act like. Uh, uh, but let's like, face yeah. it, he won by threading a needle from a hundred yards. Yeah. He won Pennsylvania, which never goes Stunning, every Democrat. county, yeah. He won Michigan, which was never um, attended by the uh, Clintons. Yeah. They didn't put TV up on the, yeah. they didn't do a, any polling in, in Michigan, yeah. Wisconsin. Took it for granted completely. So, but he feels he got there by this uh, demeaning of other people. Mm. And defending, um, you know, that kind of base all the way through. And so he might have wow. learned a lesson tonight yeah. that, that doesn't always work. And it, it's, it's going to be a problem for him in two years. He has time to correct it. Will he do it knowing what we know about the way he... What moves and motivates him? Does he really want the presidency? Is he really going to run again for re-election? You know, how does this benefit him, his family, etc.? Maybe he learns from that and listens to sounder players that are around him and all. But uh, I'm not Good sure that that's going to be the case at all. Him. I just don't see that. But let's face it, he's a force. Yeah. He's absolute force. And he has brought up issues that people are, are concerned about. Mm -hmm. So there needs to be immigration reform in the country. I think both sides agree to that. He took advantage of that. The thing I think that's offensive to me as a person is the, the, the part where he tends to seem to side with folks racially on the side that are discriminating. And so. 
That is a wedge issue that is in every single election. Race plays yeah. itself out in all these elections. Oh. And so he's aware of that. Yeah, yeah. and he knows well, how to play that, and players with him like Bannon yeah. knew how to take advantage of yeah, The politics of them, what Bill Clinton did the exact opposite of in 1992 when he said, that's what this is about. What you're hearing from the other side, they're trying to make you think about them, those folks that you're worried about. And, you know, the racial overtone of that and all the rest. Them. Exactly. Yes. It's us versus it's, it's them. It's an old dog whistle. It and really, that's the divide yeah, that we have yeah. right now in this country. Yeah. I want you to save that sure. thought, Tony. Uh, Elizabeth Warren has been declared the winner of the state Senate seat. We're going to go to our 22 News reporter, Haley Crumbleholm. She's live at her campaign party in Boston. Haley, what are things, what are you looking at over there? Tell me what's going on. What's the energy? Senator Elizabeth Warren is being projected as the official winner of this Senate race. She is being elected by Massachusetts voters to her second term in the Senate, beating out her Republican competitor, Jeff Deal. Hundreds of people are here right now at the Copley Plaza in Boston. They're still waiting to have Senator Warren come out to deliver a victory speech. It's been an upbeat mood all evening. There was a brass band, and Warren was projected to win early on this evening, so it's been an upbeat mood all night. Union members spoke on behalf of Senator Warren earlier this evening, but she has not yet come out to deliver that victory speech. But when she does, we'll have it for you here on 22 News. Live in Boston, Haley Crumblehall, 22 News. It is 926. Oh, so we're still talking about Elizabeth Warren now. <laughs> she has been declared a winner. She's had, she had that huge gap. I mean, we spoke about this earlier. You weren't surprised, neither were you, Paul, with her being reelected to a second term. What is that Elizabeth Warren factor that people just gravitate towards? What is she, it about yeah, her? She's an old holds barred liberal. She's not trying to parse anything. She's going for it. She's in that Bernie Sanders where the, all the energy seems to be in the party. So um, she's got that fire. Um, and, and, you know, the issue is, does it transfer to a national election? I think one of the things we're learning tonight is a lot of these candidates that went through primaries are the ones, for instance, in Florida for running uh, and in Georgia. Both candidates decided I'm not going to be middle of the road. I'm going to go to that left. I'm going to go to that Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren space in the Democratic Party. Now, let's see if it works in right. really red states. Yeah. Sure. But she's got that fire. I think she has the credentials. Uh, the progressive credentials, and I think it's a give and take. I think people are fired up about her, and I think, you know, she reciprocates. And I like, you actually just spoke about, uh, you said Georgia and Florida, so Stacey mm. Abrams and Andrew Gillum. Sure. Uh, what do you think the outcomes will be in those races? Because those are really tight That's hard. races. They're very tight. Those are uphill battles for both. What I'm hearing from friends in Georgia right now is that it could be tight enough that this would be a runoff. That's how it works there. If it's so tight and you know, so close to 50, 50 exactly. Yeah. So watch what happens then. The nation runs there. There will be Democrats yeah. and activists and consultants from all over the country, and that's where we're going. It'll, it'll, if people will be down there and, and that particular government. I was in Georgia race. last week, and every single ad was an attack ad. Um, and most of them... Against uh, Abrams. Most of them against Abrams, yeah. Stunning, yeah. But do you Stunning think that really onslaught. works? I well, mean, the attack you know, ad. Some people don't like yeah, when you start to play dirty. Yeah, I think people this becoming a little bit immune to it. Yeah. Um, but again, those ads in Georgia, very much blowing that's the their racial... Very uh, much so. Whistle without yeah. much, you know, yeah. without much disguise. So that ends up trying. The the intent at that point is to increase the turnout. People are already in their camps. It's right. whether you're going to fire them up to come out. Now this is Baker. This is his party right now. Uh, this is taking place in Boston. I'm not exactly sure where about, but you can see that his party is packed with supporters. They're there. They're waiting on, uh, I guess, the man himself, Governor Baker, who was just reelected to a uh, second term. Mm -hmm. right? right, second term. This is actually his third run. And the and the first the, the, his first election was a tight race. Very. We were talking very. about that earlier against Coakley, um, and that went into the next night. day just yeah. to figure out. Who won? Who won? And so a lot of people felt that Coakley wasn't a great candidate, and Baker was a really good candidate, and it was still close. Right. Uh, but I think he's proven himself. Tony mentioned earlier Polito, who's been kind of the point person on those relationships with the communities. 
Um, That's a great point. I yeah. mean, I, we see her in Western all Massachusetts the all the time. She's the, very much so on the ground on here. The, ground. the yeah. big difference between the gubernatorial campaign, the governor's race that he lost, and the next one, I think very much so, was the difference between his running mate, uh, to say, mm. versus Karen Polito. <laughs> I, this lady amazes me. I, I see her in Western Massachusetts' events as early as 6.30 in the morning. You know, I'd love to know what kind of caffeine yeah, she just has go, access go, to. Go, go, go. It's she so just true. He was running the first time yeah. against uh, a popular governor, true. Deval Patrick. Deval Patrick, yes. right. And sometimes in politics, you almost have to lose that first time to mm -hmm. learn how to actually run and how to win. That's a great point. Um, mm -hmm. And so I, I remember going to an event um, that Baker was at, and he said, uh, I lost last time. I, I, I went to get some guys who are really smart about numbers uh, from MIT and fi figured out how do you do, you know, uh, voter outreach and how do the numbers work. He's a really bright guy. Yeah. So you figure it out. You lose, you learn a lot, you move on. A lot of times you win the next time out. And he's likable. I mean, his very, approval very ratings very across the country are extremely guy, without a doubt. Yeah, no. He's someone that will stop and take a photograph with someone. Uh, he's a man of the people. He'll spend time with folks. Very much so. He's mm -hmm. easygoing in that regard. And I will say this, too. Not since Bill Weld have I seen a governor who had so little fear of picking up a large stein of beer and just <laughs> several events you know, in a row or whatnot. Well, I'm just not, I mean, amazing. He's a big man. Remember he's when large, yeah. they were doing yeah. an environmental announcement at the Charles River? Yeah. In, in, in his entire yeah. suit, Bill yeah. Bell well, dove, dove in. into yeah. the Charles yeah. River. I said, that guy yeah. is a man of the people. He is. <laughs> he is. Well, we're going to take a quick break right now. It is 921. You're watching 22 News, a special election coverage exclusively online at WWLP.com. We're showing you some of the results, both locally and nationally. Stay with us. We'll be right back.
Live from the 22 News Broadcast Center, this is an update from your local election headquarters. The time is now 926. You're watching 22 News special election coverage just into our newsroom. The Massachusetts Nurses Association has conceded defeat on question one. That means no nurse to patient ratios will be put in place here in Massachusetts. And now the results continue to come in and 22 News is working for you with live team coverage of the races across the state. Let's go to 22 News reporter Haley Crumble home. She's live at Senator Elizabeth Warren's now victory party at Copley Plaza in Boston. One hell of a run, didn't we? Hundreds of people are packed into the ballroom at the Fairmont Copley Plaza here in Boston tonight. You can see behind me right now Jay Gonzalez, who had been running as the Democratic challenger to Governor Baker for the governor's seat governor is Baker currently speaking and addressing the crowd. I also All of the Democrats are here at Copley Plaza tonight, including Senator, Senator Elizabeth Warren. She has not yet come out to deliver a victory speech, but she is the projected winner in this race. And Jay Gonzalez is conceding. We'll have more live on 22 News. Live in Boston, here we crumble home, 22 News. And you just heard from Haley Crumble home, Jay Gonzalez conceding on stage there. Republican Governor Charlie Baker has been reelected to a second four term. Baker and Lieutenant Governor Karen Polito turned back a challenge from Democrat Jay Gonzalez, a former state budget official. And in the race for Attorney General, Maura Healey is running for a second term. She has a significant lead over Republican challenger Jay McMahon. You can see she has 71% of the vote there. And 22 News is your local election headquarters. We'll continue this coverage throughout the night, and you can get a full wrap-up on 22 News at 10 and 11. Watching 22 News special election coverage exclusively online at WWLP.com. Now, people have been at the polls all day across the country. Our Washington correspondent Morgan Wright is live in Washington, D.C. to talk with us about some of the races going on nationally. Now, Morgan, thank you so much for joining us. What has inspired Democratic and Republican voters to get out to the polls this midterm election? Well, there's certainly been a lot on the table to inspire uh, voters on both sides of the aisle. Political experts that I've spoken with have said this isn't really an issues-based uh, election, but rather a referendum on President Trump and his agenda. Voters are either going to vote for President Trump and his agenda or vote against him. So we'll see how that plays out and materializes at the polls. But Democratic officials that I've spoken with have said that issues do matter, issues such as health care, issues such as uh, immigration, gun control and the economy all matter and even president's tr president trump's tone and rhetoric leading up to the election and the days ahead of the election where you had pittsburgh taking place that horrible horrible tragedy taking place at that synagogue in pittsburgh uh, there was sort of a divisive tone there so uh 
people are divided here. Republican voters are paying attention to uh, Senate Democrats' behavior during the Kavanaugh hearing, and they're also paying attention to immigration. That's one of President Trump's key issues. Uh, currently, there is a Honduran caravan making its way to the United States border, and that has really revved up the Republican base and Republican candidates to get out and do something about that. So, Morgan, what congressional races stand out the most in the Northeast region? Yeah, political experts that I speak with say that in order for Democrats to retake the House, that path runs right through Pennsylvania. There's three key states that we're paying attention to in the Northeast region. That's Pennsylvania, New York, and New Jersey. Pennsylvania, specifically with Connor Lamb and the Congressional District 17, it's Connor Lamb versus Keith Rothfuss, incumbent versus incumbent. You have Connor Lamb, who has really good name ID and name recognition with voters. He was victorious in a special election earlier this year and a district that President Trump won back in 2016 by nearly 19 points. So it just goes to show you that these really red seats in Trump country can be flipped blue by Democrats. We're also paying attention to races in Pennsylvania's Congressional District 1, 10, and 12. In addition to that, New, New York is another key state that we're focusing on. Uh, you have New York 19 with uh, John Faso facing off against Antonio Delgado, and you have New York 22. That's Claudia Tenney facing off against Anthony Brindisi. Now, Republican officials that I've spoken with have said that uh, their candidates have litigated the issues very well, and the Democratic candidates don't really fit the districts well, so we'll see how that plays out later on in the night as those polls close uh, uh, some point this evening. I believe it's 9 p.m. The president has said that the midterm elections are all about him. What has his impact been on voter, voter turnout? Yeah, the president has had a huge impact this midterm election. As, as you've seen, he's been on uh, the campaign trail. He's rallying for candidates, giving them those extra pushes to get them over the finish line. Uh, some of these districts are seen as toss up. So, you know, he's tweeting about these candidates. He's really getting Republican voters revved up on the issues that matter. Once again, immigration being a key issue. Uh, he's tweeting. He's very vocal about this. And political experts say that he's just doing what he does best. He's out being campaigner in chief. So he's had a huge impact. If Democrats actually regain control of the House and the Senate, what does that mean? Yeah, that means uh, President Trump will be under a microscope. You know, they'll hold him accountable for his actions. Democrats are poised to uh, take control of the House of Democrats. Uh, that's what political experts are telling me. They're poised to take control of that chamber. Uh, the Senate, they have a much tougher road to doing that. But if they do take control of the House of Representatives, uh, you'll see more investigative committees uh, taking place and holding President Trump accountable for his actions. You'll see uh, gun control being addressed, something that the Republicans have really drugged their feet on. So these are all things that Democrats could potentially do if they win either one of these chambers. Well, thank you, Morgan, so much for joining us. That was Morgan Wright, our D.C. correspondent thank live you. in Washington, D.C., with just giving us an overall look of how things are going nationally. Now we're back at Senator Elizabeth Warren's campaign party that's taking place at the Copley Plaza. This is her party. I heard that Jay Gonzalez was just on stage. Uh, basically, you know, he did not win. Governor Baker was reelected to a second term as governor. Uh, so he was just letting the crowd know he was given his uh, thanks for all the supporters that are there. Now, we're still waiting to hear from Senator Elizabeth Warren, waiting to hear her victory speech, uh, just to hear how excited she is for another term. Now, what do you guys think about that? Do you think she'll complete the full term or do you think she'll bow early? I think early? she's going. You I, think I, she's I going? Think she's absolutely going. think she's going. Yeah. No question. Yeah. You know, earlier this year, when a lot of folks were, when she was saying, no, 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 I'm not going to, it was the obvious. She had picked up some new political consultants. These were national players who had a uh, background in presidential campaigns. And as we had talked about earlier, she was making significant political and, uh, and personal uh, Got it. contributions. I'm sorry, I hate to stop sure, you there, Tony, on. but we're actually going to go to our 20s News reporter, Jody Reed. She is live in Boston. Jody, what's going on there? What's the energy? We are so excited here. Everybody in the room is really excited and waiting for the governor to take the stage. His Democratic challenger, Jay Gonzalez, just called to concede. So everybody's waiting for him to lay out his plan for his second term. Everybody's
is obviously very excited. The room is filled with energy. Everybody just wants the governor to come out and talk and be one of them. They've Everybody here today has talked about how personal he is and how personable he can be and will be in the future. They're really excited for to hear his second term plan and what he has store in store for the future of the Commonwealth. We're here at the Highland Center and we're live. Thank you, Jody. We appreciate that coverage. Now we have Ashley Afonso here, our 22 News anchor. Ashley, I know you want to ask our two political consultants some questions. Yeah, hey guys. I think we have hey. to go back to question one. Uh, so Massachusetts Nurses Association conceding defeat on this question that would have put patient to nurse ratios. What do we think? What are your thoughts on that? You know, that? what happens is if people are concerned about something and there's a question uh, and they're they'll vote no on something. Status quo was always a better option than trying something that you really don't know. So not that people were not telling the truth on either side, but there was enough confusion that I think people, it was very easy for people to say, let's just keep the status quo. My hospital's telling me and I, you know, uh, that it's gonna cost a lot more money. I think people do know that that trickles down to the patient. So I think whenever, whenever in doubt, people will go no on yeah. something. A great line by Vince Lombardi. When in doubt, don't. That was always relative to certain plays on the field, and that's the case here, too. This was one of those issues that was almost impossible for the average person to completely understand. So you have to kind of Absolutely. look at this and say, you know, who's saying what? Who are the, who's endorsing? I often we'll say endorsements don't make that much of a difference, but when it's in all the hospitals in the Commonwealth, when it's every major media outlet in Massachusetts saying, gosh, this is not a good idea, that has an impact. That makes a difference. And a billion dollars. I, no. I mean, that's what we were hearing. It would cost a billion dollars in its first year just to roll out this new law. Who, who would have been fitting the bill? I mean, are we talking taxpayers? It would have been the taxpayer. It would have been the Commonwealth overall, people, uh, corporations, consumers. businesses, consumers, exactly. Consumers. You'd be paying for it. You'd feel this. You would actually feel this. And it was an outside independent group that came up with those numbers. And that was stunning, too, that they actually took a look at this, crunched the numbers, so to speak, and came back to say, holy smokes, not only that, it probably would have caused the demise of a lot of community hospitals. And for us in Western Massachusetts, those are the little hospitals that we've got to have. That's Holyoke Hospital. That's, you know, some of the small, smaller. And they would have lost millions. Stunning, exactly. Providence Hospital, with its unique mission, you know, which is so different than all the others, especially in the relative to the opiate uh, crisis, uh, mental health issues, substance abuse, to lose something like that here in Western Massachusetts, that would have been egregious. And I think they did a good job with the earned media, getting that out. Yeah. Here's what happens. I mean, at the same time, I think people feel more nurses is probably good, but the question is how much. Yeah, and we're starting to get a look at just mm. how big of a margin that was just 12% of precincts reported there and 70% saying no, 70% of voters there and 30 saying yes. So mm. that's quite a bit of a margin, obviously only a small percentage of votes in. So those numbers could change around a little bit. Do you think this goes to show how much of a role political ads can play? Oh, I mean, this sure. was Absolutely. one sure. of Definitely. the biggest oh, yeah. ad yeah. drivers here. You know, yeah. a few years ago, there was a right to die. Um, mm -hmm. initiative yes. that was way ahead yeah. and, and then the consultants got involved and the TV commercials right. started and that thing flipped. So no question. Um, I will say it's tougher to get your message out just through TV now. I think social media is playing a bigger and bigger role. People are being targeted. Um, I think the anti side got out there early. They put their nurses out and I think that the other side probably never recovered from that. So I think they were surprised by that. That that it was almost it was almost like po uh, political judo, so to speak, taking mm. the other uh, team's sure. energy and using it against them. That definitely was something that you're right. They just never recovered. They kind of protested it for the most part. Oh, this isn't fair. That's not right. Well, it's politics. That's, yeah. that's unfortunately <laughs> that's the game. It's not fair. But in this instance, that's exactly what happened, yeah. Where do you recommend, I mean, just for the average voter, where would they go to get the correct information to vote appropriately you know, on it, these it's, issues? It's almost impossible to get to the pure middle mm. ground on something now because you get conflicting data. You know, it says this is the way it's going to be on one side, this is the way it's going to be on another side. At some point, it becomes really, really difficult for people, and it takes an enormous amount of time to actually sift through it. And even then, you don't really get to the nub of the issue. Something as complex as this, because you can't park you can't park yourself into the accountant's office mm. of a hospital. To really, no. So I think again, uh, no usually wins when people are concerned about the outcome. But where do you get it from? More and more, we're hearing right now, and, and I would say. It, it is your local media when it comes down to a local issue because it's a local news station. It's a local newspaper that's going to be more closer 
to it. It's that journalist who's on the ground in Chicopee or in Agawam who's got a feel for what's really going on or what's happening. The other thing that we're seeing too with a lot of the millennials, they're doing their homework. They're really saying, okay, what does this really mean? I'm not going to listen to the old guy or the, the, the corporate or you know what I'm just getting and learning, getting from media it, in itself in general. I want to know what the reality is here. They're doing the homework. They're digging into things. And quite often that will set the record correct uh, where there are issues that are as complex as some of these that we're talking about tonight. With question one, the other thing too, is that this is a question that had it uh, passed, it might have been reinterpreted by the legislature. The mm -hmm. legislature could have taken this up and tried to deal with it. I think that's the other message here. When we see referendums of this nature that are so, so... There's some uh, bureaucracy that comes after Thank them. you, mm -hmm. absolutely, yeah. Thank you. I was actually searching for that word. And it's a message to the legislature. You've got to deal with these kinds of things. Uh, mm -hmm. This is the important work that the, you know, the 160 House members and 40 senators are supposed to do. And what doing. we learned tonight nationally, health care is number one. Right. Absolutely. So yeah. this would mess with that equation a little yeah. bit, I think people's deferred on that one. Mm. We're starting to get results on some of the other <coughs> ballot questions as well. So question to 16% uh, of precincts reported and 72% of voters wow. so far going with yes on this one. So Absolutely. this is that um, corporations are not considered the same as a person when it comes to... Um, people are so frustrated right no. now. Um, they see it uh, and they see the lobbyists and they see the super PACs. They see these incredible amounts of money. They almost spent $100 million on the Texas Senate race. Yes, that's exactly. the largest. Largest uh, yeah. in, in every year we break a new record, right? So. Uh, Obama didn't actually I I accept uh, PAC money because he had an online, uh, you know, Campaign. Right. operation that was right. so good. Yeah. But you still have people frustrated. They see the money. They realize that Washington is basically kind of broken from getting something done, mm -hmm. and they assign that to all this money that is influencing all of these campaigns. How much more difficult could this make it, though, for candidates to raise funds? <coughs> Well, I mean, it's becoming, honestly, you have to have resources in order to run for office. An office even like mm. state representative. It's not unnatural in our market for people to take a second mortgage on their home, park that money into their political campaign, with the idea that they could win, and then pay themselves back at some point. I've been involved, I'm sure you have a lot of campaigns where people do that. Uh, so you have to have resources. So in a lot of ways, it's it's you know negating a lot of people who would want to. The, the citizen, uh, you know, the citizen that wants to run for office, is not happening anymore. You really have to have resources. You've got to have some dollars. You've got to, to really go out and campaign the way that someone like Beto O'Rourke is right now. Stacey Abrams, you know, the backstory of Stacey Abrams. My gosh, she's an incredibly accomplished, uh, uh, self self made. Uh, a person who's done some amazing things, started some amazing businesses, so she's got some money. She's able to take that whole year and go out there and campaign. You've got to have that luxury to a certain degree. On the other hand, we see average regular folks in campaigns. I'll use Joe Comerford again as an example. Paul mentioned earlier, my gosh, a writing campaign in 100 days, 100 days, a writing campaign to get on the ballot. There's still that aspect of elbow grease. Her kitchen cabinet, her workers, her volunteers, these folks that really believed in her and a, a great candidate who could go out and do that kind but of work. She had move on. As her that's right. Yeah, but it really helped. Paul, I swear once again, that's exactly what you know. She had the experience as the executive director of MoveOn.org. She knew what to do. And that's what makes that difference. You're right. You've got to know what to do. So hopefully you've got a good consultant, the guy to do that, or you've got a great kitchen cabinet, so to speak. Or like Joe Comerford, you already know how to do it because you've helped others do it. For the average person who decides to run for office, how much money are you talking? If you're running for state senate in, in Western Massachusetts, probably two hundred thousand dollars. Wow! If you're running for state representative and you're not known to mm -hmm. have a chance to win, you, you probably have to do six figures. No name recognition is a big right. deal. For and does this go back to looking at the governor's race? Why Jay Gonzalez had such an issue? Yeah, I'm sure he had low name name recognition. Yeah. Extremely yeah. low name recognition. And you, know? you have to spend, you have to burn through so much money just to get the brand yeah. out there before you even tell people what you're for. Yeah. So it's really, really hard to run for office. We've seen this in so many uh, elections. The sheriff's campaign in 2016, Nick Kochi, mm -hmm. on paper, arguably, holy smokes, look at this guy. He's actually done the job. He's been doing the job. He's been number two. Low, low name recognition. Extremely right? no, low name recognition. And so you have to build that. The average person out there had to learn who this fellow was, that he had been number two at the jail, that he had been an innovator himself, had won all these awards and accomplished all these things in 23 years. And to do that, it takes money. 
Yeah, it's almost like a product. You're introducing a new product, which happens to be a person in their mm -hmm. name. Yes. So you have to burn X amount of dollars to get in into the cycle. Oh, if you're running right. against a uh, incumbent who has high name recognition, no. you burn so much money just to get in the in the game. And it's one of the reasons why incumbents hate to have debates, <laughs> right? <laughs> right? And we yeah. saw that with yeah. Governor Charlie Baker. Free commission for so the other really candidate. We have to do that yeah. because why am I giving, you know, so I'm here and they're here and they're immediately going to rise. Right. I'm, I'm as at the ceiling of, of the, of in terms of name recognition. Why am I going to do this favor? So that's why the backstory why every candidate who's uh, an incumbent says, yeah, we'll debate, but Absolutely, can we work yeah. on those details yeah. and yeah. And maybe we'll only have one instead of two. So. And we actually, we talked about this earlier, how it's so hard sometimes to unseat someone who's already in a yeah. position, especially Absolutely. if they have high approval ratings. Sure, they've got brand recognition, name recognition. They've done some favor for someone that's, that, that's impacted a voter's family. You know, they do constituent work when they're in office, and people will remember that. Uh, I mentioned District Attorney Galuni earlier. Certainly it's not constituent work, but you look at his first four years, it's probably a reason that he did not have an opponent for re-election. When you look at the, the high profile of the Lisa Ziegert case, mm. which predecessors had, had wish, wished, all of us had wished, that someone had been able to accomplish that earlier. You know, you look at that kind of work and it pays dividends at election time, especially if the electorate believes you're doing the job and impacting their life in a positive way. And if you look at Congress, if you're an incumbent, incumbents uh, there's some losing yeah. tonight, but don't frequently lose because the political action committees start to park money in those congressional seats so that it's not unusual for mm. a member of Congress to have a million, million and a half, two million uh, Absolutely. or more yeah. in, their, in their bank account. Yeah. And speaking of incumbent, Secretary of State William Galvin just won um, a seventh four-year term, that mm. just into our newsroom. So what are he's your thoughts on that He's one? amazing. <laughs> Did you, is that no surprise there it's for no you? It's no surprise huh. because every four years they say this is yeah. the year that they get them. Honestly, I don't know the number of terms, right. but it's forever. Yeah. Uh, oh, wow, by a big margin yeah. once yeah. again. It's a huge he's, margin, he's, yeah. 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 And even more impressive was his Democratic primary victory over City Councilor Josh Zakem, Boston mm. City Councilor, because Zakem pulled out the stops. And, and, won, and won the primary. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, won the, convention. the Democratic Convention, yeah. absolutely. Which also shows, too, that sometimes what happens at the convention doesn't, doesn't translate, translate, translate to the average regular person out there. The average person looked at Galvin, and it comes back to what we talked about, too, the kind of ads that he did. He didn't go after his opponent so much as he said, I'm Secretary of State, and that's kind of boring on the election side of it, but it's important. But here's what else I do. You know, he's I'm, also all yeah. politics local type exactly, of guy. He did yeah. do a lot, and the, these tax credits that actually have to go through the Secretary of right. State's office, almost all these yeah. development projects that happen in Western Mass or anywhere Huge. have to go through the Secretary yeah. of State's office. It might be inside baseball, but a lot of people know about it. Absolutely. That. And then his protection of seniors as he came out with, uh, and, and consumer protection items that he does. Yeah. You know, in a lot of places you'd assume that that would be the Attorney General's role, but in Massachusetts, the Secretary of State does have a lot of prevail over that. And his ads were exceptional in that regard. Yeah. Trying to get some of the results, of course, the it's technology <laughs> not working for me on um, ballot question three. So maybe we can pull up those numbers possibly. Of course, my computer not working here. There we go. Okay, this right. was upholding the law that's already in place. 69% uh, of voters saying yes so far mm. with what is that? 21% of precincts reporting. So no surprise there. Yeah. Double. You know, it's a law, it's an existing law. Um, and I think we were talking about this earlier. I think the legislature kind of was trying to reflect uh, on that law, their constituents, um, and there's a constituency for that, and the idea that it's not discriminate, not, it's a discrimination, anti-discrimination law. That's always gonna probably pass in a state like Massachusetts. And you had a group coming in that trying to upturn that. I just feel like um, that's another one of those social wedge issues. I mm. just don't think it's gonna fly in a state like Massachusetts. Yeah. Basic human rights issue, and yes. average regular folks saying, hey, wait a second, I'm not like that. And I love their use in the campaign of law enforcement players coming out and saying, listen, this is discrimination, and gosh, it's in the time that this law has been on the books, there hasn't been a single problem, a single issue that's been brought mm. up in any of the 351 cities and towns in Massachusetts where there's been a, even a complaint over, over some of the issues that the Wedge Group was trying to come forth with. Yeah. Yes, and uh, there was a lot of fear that yeah. they were putting out there, you know, people afraid to send their mm. children into the bathroom because they were yeah. saying a man would come in yeah. pretending to be a woman. Mm. I think it's a whole lot deeper for someone who is transgender. Yeah. I don't think they're yeah. pretending to be right. something. The proponents made it so much real when they showed uh, young folks, you know, speaking about, you know, gosh, golly gee, was I just want to be protected and safe at school. And then as they say too, to see police chiefs and others saying, this is the right thing to do. Got it. 
All right. Well, you're still watching 22 News. We have our special election coverage. We got about, what, 10 minutes until 22 News at 10 on the CW starts. All right. We're going to go. We're going to look at some slates. Sorry, you don't know what slates are. We're going to look at what <laughs> we're going to take a quick commercial break and we'll be right back. Again, you're watching 22 News' exclusive online election coverage, both locally and nationally. Stay with us. We'll be right back.
2022. Live from the 22 News Broadcast Center, this is an update from your local election headquarters. All right, the time right now is 9.56. You are watching a 22 News special election night update. Governor Baker easily won his second term as Massachusetts governor. Let's go live right now to 22 News State House reporter Jody Reed. She's live at the Heinz Convention Center where Baker is joining the party. Energy here is unbelievable. Everyone's waiting for Governor Baker to take the stage to lay out his plan for the next four years. Just moments ago, Democratic challenger Jay Gonzalez called the governor to concede and addressed his campaign about the loss. At the Heinz Convention Center, Jody Reed, 22 News. Thank you for joining us on 22 News for our special election edition. I'm Tishani Whitlaw. Now, we've been broadcasting all night live on air and online at WWLP.com. We're giving you the local and national election results. I'm joined by two very prominent political consultants. We have Tony Signoli and we have Paul Robbins. Thank you guys so much for Thank joining you. us. Thank you. This so what do you think so far? Okay, so NBC News is mm. projecting that Republicans have maintained the Senate and that Democrats now have <clears throat> control of the House. No surprise. Yeah. What does that mean? As hoped for, as thought by, by prognosticators and others. Yeah. In the, in the Senate, you know, the whole Senate isn't up at one time. About a third of the Senate is up. And the way the map worked, most of the Senate seats that were up were in red states. Tough really course. hard. You have to hold and then gain mm. new ones. So no surprise there. Uh, House, probably no surprise there either. It's more of a national referendum okay. uh, in, the, in the House. So you will have divided government, which I think is what people actually want. They want balance right now. So what does that mean for us here in Western Massachusetts, just for the you it know, means average that Richard voter? Neal is going to be chairman of Ways and Means, which is a That's major, huge. major yep. development. And Congressman McGovern will be the chairman of the Rules Committee. Both, <coughs> both the members are ranking right now in, on those two committees. And that's gigantic for Western Massachusetts because we've seen both in their time in Congress bring so much back to their districts overall, throughout the entirety of the district, and the large, diverse districts that both men represent. And yet, what they've been able to do without <coughs> that leadership mantle has been amazing. Now, the expectation is even greater. And of course, too, we have to remember that, especially for Congressman Neal, he'll be in a position right now to work with Republicans, with other Democrats, to actually try to get some things done. And I hope this will come across as a compliment, because I don't want to offend Richie Neal, especially not now, right? <laughs> but he's always kind of been viewed as one of those homework guys. He's a policy wonk. He's a little bit nerdy in that regard. He's one of the few people that really understands tax policy and gets into it. Well, plus and the other thing is he's, yeah. a, he's a relationship builder. Bang. Yeah, we yeah. talked about it earlier, yeah. him taking to heed the uh, Tip O'Neill adage all politics are local, yeah. but he believes in the institution. And so he's made friends on both sides of the aisle. Exactly. We benefited from yeah. him just being the ranking member of yeah. Ways and Means. Now he's going to be the chair, yeah. and all appropriations go through the House. So it's great. I think also, you know, you have to, people have to start to work across the aisle. He's one of those guys that can do yeah. that. So it'd be really He's got a track record of doing it already, sure. and he's respected by a lot of <coughs> members. Uh, on the Republican side of the aisle. So does that mean more money here yeah, in Western more, Massachusetts it, it does. will come back? It does, basically. The bottom line, is it does. Yeah. And for Massachusetts, you know, he's the dean of the Massachusetts delegation. You know, yes. so that's yeah. an extremely powerful position. And so, you know, I think it's good for Democrats all over. Um, it's particularly good for our region. I think it's great, too, because a lot of times, uh, people in the western part of the state feel like the eastern part of the state forgets about us. <coughs> so to have Absolutely. someone like Richie Neal in such a powerful position sure. from western Massachusetts still very much so connected to this area. The Globe did a area. really interesting story yeah. a couple of years ago <clears> that said it's Richie Neal's time. Mm. You know that he's kind of patiently waited, yeah. done the constituent work, worked within the institution to make friends both sides of the aisle. And now here he is. You know, he was young Richie Neal, yeah. we all knew him, yeah. and now he's in this position. It's really and so, great. an amazing amount of energy, very <laughs> dynamic, very on top of issues and all. But even another point, too, as you, you just mentioned, so often here in Western Massachusetts, we're considered not to be of importance to Washington, to Boston. Well, certainly now will be extremely important to Washington, despite the fact that Neal was making sure that that was the case. But now adding McGovern to that as well. And on, this, on the uh, state side of it, you know, we lost a Senate president in this last cycle. Yes. And we lost three powerful House chairs 
you know, in the in north of, of Greater Springfield. And so now a lot of us will be looking to see what's next. There's always that aspect of politics. This is great tonight, but what's next? What happens in the House of Representatives in Massachusetts now? Does Speaker DeLeo, <coughs> who arguably uh, appointed more chairs in Western Massachusetts than almost any other speaker ever, including a former speaker from, from Western Massachusetts, does he remember that and, re and appoint some members here to those chairmanships? Does he give us a power base? in the House once again. So that's the kind of uh, other aspect of politics that begins now, too, the politics of Beacon Hill. Now, okay, so NBC also reported that the Florida governor's race is extremely close, that mm. and Georgia. Yeah. What are you guys thinking? Yeah, so th those that's a hard seat to win, um, and there was a lot of negative uh, money poured in against the uh, Democrat. Those governor's races in Florida, though, tend to kind of mirror if this was a presidential election. Mm. And how many times have we seen Florida, 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 right? Mm -hmm. the, the election yeah, comes down to it. Yeah. It's an almost a completely... Always down to Florida. You have the panhandle, which is very conservative, Fox News territory. You have southern Florida, um, south Florida, which is the urban areas, which mm -hmm. are Democratic. And then there's that beltway in between, you know, that highway yeah. in between with Tampa that goes to uh, Orlando. And that's the flip part of the, of, of the state, would be massively, you know, uh, it would be a massive victory for the Democrats to, to pull that one off. Gigantically so. But maybe if these races are close, <coughs> it helps set the base for Democrats in the future. That's even the situation, I think, right now in Texas. Uh, an incredible amount of money, as Paul said uh, a little while ago, uh, to spend on the Democratic side, $100 million. That's astonishing. But maybe this changes or starts to begin a change of Texas well, politics. You, you could make the case that when before the Comey bombshell mm -hmm. for Clinton, when they thought they had Pennsylvania and Michigan and Wisconsin mm -hmm. already locked up, before that bombshell about the emails, they were actually feeling they could compete in places like Georgia and Texas. Yeah. So the future, because of demographics, is changing in those states. And the time is in the not too distant future that a, a Democrat can win in, in a statewide election and a presidential. And so, you know, one of the lessons, cautionary tales, is they put some of their resources in there to think they could maybe flip that, mm. and they they forgot about these Rust Belt, um, you know, states that Absolutely. ended up being the margin of victory yeah. for Trump. And you even we will look at this, you know, when it's over, and say how much of that money that went to Beto that came from around the nation could have really helped someone right. hang on to a seat or take another seat Democratic. But you know, you have to push the you know yeah. refrigerator back and forth yeah. a little bit before you you finally get there so i guess in the future when that state eventually does flip mm. at some point towards the democrats at least for one statewide election in the future you can see that coming they'll look back yeah. and say this was the this was the game plan this is the blueprint that was established that yeah. helped make it happen now um women play a huge role in politics especially on the voting side I know I had read somewhere if um, <laughs> the majority of the women, if they came together and voted, we could actually change, For change sure. policies. For sure, absolutely. Can you talk about how sometimes uh, the, the voice of the female voter is sometimes underrated? Well, I think this might be an election where we start to see that change. When you look at how many women ran for office, and great minorities. candidates, mm -hmm. absolutely, women, minorities, veterans, we've seen more on both parties than we've seen in quite some time. And also, when we take a look at state legislatures, you know, so often we think about the, the we forget that aspect <coughs> uh, of this game, that it's the state legislatures in each of these states that are so important as well. You know, a lot of people are talking about blue wave and, and all that. I think it's kind of a bit of a pink wave that's gone on right now. I and like that. I th Thank the, you. the thing that's really interesting is it's not a monolithic group. Mm -hmm. Hillary Clinton uh, yeah. lost because yeah. of, of the, the absence of enough female voters for her. Yeah. So you have to have all the other right stuff. You're right. If, if it was a block, you know, it, it could it could dominate every single election. Just like millennials, yeah. if, they, yes. if, if they were voting together on something, could change every election. But I think the point that there's more women running. Mm. Um, the one thing the Democrats, I think, did that was really smart um, was they found a lot of good candidates. A lot of them were women. They were veterans. They were war heroes. Yeah. They put them in a lot of those districts. That was pretty smart on their part because women are voting. And they've listened to the last two years, you know, of the president um, and some of his, um, you know, lesser moments where he's, he's got himself in trouble. I think that motivated a lot of women, and it's certainly suburban women are probably yeah. uh, voting for the Democrats. And before 2016, there were an awful lot of women who are often smarter than men to begin with and who look at issues and are better informed, who are kind of saying, I don't want any part of this stuff. This politics stuff is crazy. If I get out to vote, I do. If I don't, we, we're seeing something different right now. Everyone's gotten the drift. Holy smokes, it does matter. 
you know, who you vote for, who you vote for for president, for the House, for the Senate, because it impacts so many other things. This last, that's the 2016 race, was really not just a presidential, it was the race for the Supreme Court. And look at that impact. And, that, and that's what I've seen in a lot of polling that women really got the drift of. Oh my gosh, what did we do by not coming out for Hillary because we didn't like her or we were angry or with Bernie or whatever? Wow, what did we do? So I think there's a kind of a, a cautionary tale from 2016 and an awakening, a huge awakening. And I don't think this is the end of it, what we're seeing in this election right now. Well, speaking of women, Massachusetts just voted their first black uh, congresswoman, yeah. Ayanna Presley, out yeah. of Boston. She'll be heading up to Washington. That's a good thing, is it? Yeah, it's a great I thing. Think it's, huge. it's a great thing. Yeah. Um, and I think it's a kind of thing that breaks a barrier. People need to see that. Um, just like uh, Abrams in, in Georgia. You have to mm. see yes. it to believe it. And, and Ocasio uh, as well. Out of great, yeah. great York. example would shock everybody. Yeah. If you don't feel that you can participate because it doesn't look like you, you don't maybe take the opportunity to do something. That's a great point. Yeah. It opens things up. And so people say, I can do that. And maybe times are different. Uh, and maybe people will listen to my message and, you know, I can galvanize people, get people who haven't voted before into the polls to vote. I think it's great and I think we're going to see a lot more of that going mm -hmm. forward. Did you have any thoughts on that, Tony? It'll be interesting <coughs> to see how quickly Ayanna Presley hits the ground running and I think you'll see that because she's got a district that knew that it's her predecessor brought back a lot. I think I said it earlier, a billion dollars back to the That's district a lot of money. with a B in his time as a member of Congress. She's aggressive, she's super sharp and intelligent, she's got a great group of people around her, and she's gonna know, she's gotta produce for this constituent base. And it's a constituent base that's changed greatly over the course of the time that Capuano was there. It's something that even he recognized. He said, I don't begrudge this at all, I understand this. I did a good job, people do like me. Times are changing. But the times are changing and I don't look like my district anymore. I was amazed when he said that. He kind of set the stage to say, I don't look like my district. And that's district. going to be the case in yeah. the presidential elections going forward. You know, everyone talked about this last mm. election that white males essentially yeah. won the election for, for Trump. Those demographics aren't going away. In not too many years, we're going to be a major majority minority. They're going to be more Hispanic, Lat uh, yeah. Latin voters yeah. in, the, in the country and, and population than there will be white voters. So. We're, this is the tip of the iceberg. We're starting to see things change. Yeah. Yeah. Do you feel that um, <coughs> Hispanic voters are sometimes forgotten about? Because I, I, for me personally, I feel like mm. whenever I hear about um, issues, it's always immigration and jobs. But I mean, there's a large percentage of the country who are Hispanic. Those are not issues that they're concerned with. So do you feel like a lot? They're going to make the difference in places like Nevada, Arizona. Uh, Texas, we no. were just talking about, even Georgia, the amount of Hispanic voters has dramatically increased. So I think you have to kind of realize the power that you have uh, before you start to exhibit it. So <clears throat> that's, that's changing. It's not going to be reversed anytime soon. You, and you're going to see more Hispanic candidates also. No. That's the no. next wave that we're going to see. Yeah. A dear friend and associate, <coughs> Jesus Vasquez in Florida, literally something that he said to me in the last couple of days. It ties right to what Paul just said. For us, for our team, for the folks that I'm trying to move around here in Florida right now, so many of us are just frustrated because we've not won. We've got to win a few. And when we win a few, or when we get in a race like this for the United States Senate in Florida, and also for the governorship of Florida, and even if we come close, it, it starts the bug. We get the drift of Absolutely. what we can do. How to do it. Ex how to do it, exactly. How to learn how to do it. And, you know, that's one of the things that he had expressed to me that whatever happens in these two races he's involved in, governorship and the U.S. Senate, where they're trying to retain the United States Senator, uh, the Democrat, Nelson, he, that's the biggest thing he's getting back. New people, for the first time, feeling energized and saying, they want us in this campaign and we're working hard and maybe there's an opportunity, and they're learning how to do it for the next time if they don't pull it off this time. All right, well, we're gonna head right into our newsroom where we can get a behind the scenes look of exactly what we're doing for you tonight on this election night. We have Monica and Tony, they are at the Web Center. They're gonna give us some more results. All right, well, uh, we're back in the newsroom. I'm Tony Fay. And I'm Monica Ritchie, and election results are still coming in. Um, nearly 10,000 people watched our online election coverage tonight, so thank you. And we'll be here all night continuing to update election results on WWLP.com. And you can also download the WWLP mobile app for the latest results and alerts sent to your phone. Yeah, absolutely. And you're going to want to stick with us, too, in the morning. If you're going to be going to bed soon, you should have even more results updated. We're kind of at that point in the night 
when we can start declaring winners and races and a lot of the numbers are becoming a little bit more clear. So uh, things are starting to come into the picture a little bit clearer right now. So you're going to want to stay with 22 News throughout the night and into the morning hours.